Next, on C-SPAN 2, it's a hearing held Monday to look at the National Energy Strategy. The House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations hears from Secretary of Energy Admiral James Watkins. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. The subject of today's hearing, the National Energy Strategy, is a matter of profound concern to every American. Too quickly, the people of the United States have forgotten the long gas lines, skyrocketing prices at the pumps of the 1970s, and the other economic, social, and political distortions that followed the Arab oil boycott and shut off and the events that followed, huge inflation, startling increases in unemployment, and great hardships for the people of this country. A lot of Americans think that those events will not repeat themselves again. But George Santayana, a noted philosopher, observed, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. One of the concerns that I have is that this country will repeat neither the experiences of the Depression, nor will we repeat the experiences that occurred with the Arab oil embargo and the events that attended those unfortunate happenings. Our recent experiences with the Valdez oil spill and with the December coal snap again demonstrate that skyrocketing prices and tight fuel supplies as well as supply and economic distortions associated with those matters are not behind us, but rather probably more before us, and perhaps more closely so than ever before. However, the December problems illustrate how our energy concerns have added a new dimension, the increased linkage of energy markets. The oil, gas, and electrical utility markets are all impacted. In addition, the energy concerns are not just limited to consumer effects. This nation's energy producers have major problems as well. Domestic oil production is declining, and this trend does not appear to be reversible. Few believe that the current prices of natural gas at below $2 per 1,000 cubic feet can maintain the production needed to cover the increasing demand put on the market by increased electrical utility use and by needs which will be stimulated by environmental laws and environmental requirements. Similarly, many believe that investment in conservation and building new electric power plants will not meet the need for electric power in the mid-1990s, a view which is shared by the present occupant of the chair. Finally, the Congress is considering far-reaching environmental legislation, such as the amendments to the Clean Air Act of 1973, which was recently reported by this committee and which was recently passed by the Senate. Such environmental legislation will have profound effects on the way that this nation produces, transports, distributes, and uses energy. And clearly it is going to have the practical effect of increasing energy use rather than encouraging conservation. The importance of a national energy strategy cannot be overemphasized. While there's little to argue with the efforts of our distinguished witness today, Secretary Watkins, a tough task is ahead, taking all the information gathered so far and establishing a coherent and comprehensive national energy strategy is going to be difficult. In this effort, the <coughs> chair will have some thoughts which I believe should be considered in connection with these matters. I'm sure that they'll not be at variance with the thoughts of our distinguished witness today. Experience has taught us that energy cannot be considered in a vacuum when it comes to setting the nation's course towards a sound energy policy. The nation must consider economic and environmental impacts that result from not only such policies, but also other policies. Conservation of all energy resources is vitally important, with reports that imported oil accounted for at least 45 percent of the nation's $109 billion trade deficit for 1989 energy conservation plays a key role in maintaining a sound U.S. economy. The United States must realize that there are no risk-free options for the environment or for energy. 
Environmentalists see coal as a harmful source of energy. However, reduction in the use of coal to generate electricity mm -hmm. will result in increased uses of other energy sources, such as petroleum and nuclear power, both of which have positive and substantial negative features. In addition, there must be incentives for industry and ordinary Americans to use energy in the most efficient and environmentally safe ways possible, not only in terms of tax incentives for industry, but the Department must provide education and other incentives for the average citizen. Finally, we must keep in mind that there is no free ride when it comes to environmental protection and energy security. These programs have to be exceedingly costly. Many of the programs are going to require trade-offs back and forth between energy and energy, between environment and environment, and between energy and environment. It is important that the Department of Energy step forward and make the tough decisions, or at least guide the making of the tough decisions. If a new pro program is proposed, how is it going to be funded? If nuclear power is to be pursued, how are the waste problems going to be resolved? There are other questions which we will have to confront as we go forward. How will we see to it that we get the best mix of energy, economy, jobs, competitiveness, and also of environment? This morning, we look forward to hearing <coughs> from the Distinguished Secretary of Energy, Admiral James D. Watkins, who will describe the efforts of the Department of Energy to put this nation back on course with a sound and comprehensive energy policy. Mr. Secretary, we thank you for being with us. Mr. Secretary, the uh, rules of this subcommittee um, go back to the days of Sam Rayburn, which was uh, well before the days that I chaired either the committee or the subcommittee. And they've required that witnesses who appear before us do appear under oath. I hope that you have no objection to doing so. We swear members of Congress right along with cabinet officials and, and everybody no else. Chairman. And we, uh, I would observe to you that, that uh, the uh, fact that we swear you doesn't mean we're investigating you today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's the nicest thing you said to me in the past year. The, uh, I note that you're accompanied by Deputy Undersecretary for Policy Planning and Analysis, Linda Stunts. Uh, she is well known to this committee. We're happy to welcome her back. Uh, Madam Secretary, we're delighted to see you here. We, uh, it is your right, Mr. Secretary, under the rules to uh, be advised by counsel since you are under oath. If you so desire, that, will, that right will, of course, be respected. It is also uh, to be observed that copies of the rules, copies of the uh, rules of both the House, the committee, and the subcommittee are there to advise you of any matters relative to your rights or limitations on the powers of the committee. Uh, is uh, Ms. Stunts going to advise you, or is she, is she going to also yes, testify? Yes, uh, she, she, I'd like to have her free to uh, testify to, to respond, uh, Mr. Chairman. Then we will swear her right along with you, Ms. Secretary. Uh, if you have no objection then, Mr. Secretary and Ms. Stunts, to being sworn, then if you'll please rise and raise your right hand, we will administer the oath. Ladies and gentlemen, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? You may each then consider yourself under oath. Ms. Secretary and Ms. Stunts, you are recognized for such statement as you choose to give. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have submitted a, uh, a more lengthy uh, statement for the record that I would like to have entered. Uh, and I would like now to give a brief summary of that uh, more detailed statement. Without objection, Mr. Secretary, the entirety of your statement will appear in the record, and you may uh, summarize in such fashion as you, as you deem appropriate. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I very much appreciate this uh, opportunity to discuss development of the national energy strategy. I'll refer to that as the NES here and after. The NES interim report that we transmitted to you on April 2nd contains some important messages from the people of the country. And today I'd like to share with you those messages and discuss plans for the next steps in the process that will lead to submission of the NES to the President in December. The National Energy Strategy we are building will provide a frame of reference for the United States to examine its policy options, taking into full account the potential effects of our choices on the environment energy supplies, and economy. At the core of the NES is a process of public consultation that is without precedent in U.S. energy planning. More public hearings and much more public comment will take place before we conclude this process at the end of the year. This approach to the National Energy Strategy has served a number of purposes. 
The first served has been public education. By the time we're through, there should be a fresh appreciation of the fact that there are no easy answers or quick fixes to the problems we face in energy and environmental areas. The second purpose has been to define the major issues and possible solutions with clarity. Already a range of views, frequently contradictory but often surprisingly convergent, has been offered concerning possible solutions. And finally, we believe that our approach to the NES is laying the foundation of public consensus necessary to make the strategy an action plan that can be sustained. Let me share with you some important points about what we've learned so far in assessing the public record. Energy efficiency. The loudest single message we have heard is that we must increase the efficiency with which we use energy in every end use sector. The American people have made substantial progress on energy conservation. There is no question, however, that greater efficiency is technically and economically feasible. The question is, what is achievable and at what cost, and who needs to be involved, and how do we get there from here? It is clear to us that substantial energy efficiency gains will require coordinated action by the federal government and by state and local governments, by utilities, by industry, and by consumers themselves. We are not waiting until the final NES is published to pursue energy efficiency improvements. DOE's FY91 budget request for conservation and renewable energy research and development is 78 percent higher than the budget request for fiscal year 90. A set of conservation and renewable energy initiatives announced in January 1990 also reflects a new commitment by DOE to these areas. Second, respect for the environment. Energy and environmental policies must be mutually sustaining. The crumbling of the Iron Curtain has shown all too well what happens when production is pursued without regard for environmental consequences. That same crumbling also has shown that only a, second, uh, only a sound economy uh, can support both quality of life and environment that Americans want. Without a healthy economy, there is no ability to replace current energy technology with newer, more efficient and cleaner plants. Environmental concerns have national and international dimensions. It will be our common challenge in the administration and in Congress to translate those concerns into common sense policies that safeguard both environment and economic well-being. We can only do this if we strive to keep science and policy linked. This is what we are trying to do on global climate change. We are investing heavily in obtaining new knowledge while taking actions to reduce net greenhouse gas emissions where justified on environmental, energy and economic grounds. We support the worldwide phase out of fluorofluorocarbons and halons by the year 2000 where safe substitutes have been proven to be available. Improved efficiency for appliances, improved lighting for federal and commercial buildings, adoption by states and local authorities of integrated resource planning and of voluntary federal building standards will reduce the need for electricity and hence CO2 emissions. The President's planning program, if continued for 20 years, would annually sequester an amount equal to 5 percent of current CO2 emissions. The acid rain and alternative fuels provisioned in the President's proposed Clean Air Act amendments will provide energy efficiency and CO2 reduction benefits. Additional CO2 reduction could be achieved if we allow hydropower to reach its full potential in balance with environmental values. Third, fortifying foundations. A vigorous program of science and technology research is fundamental to the success of any national energy strategy. Past national energy planning efforts have tended not to include substantial consideration of basic research and technology transfer. But investment in fundamental research is a precondition for reaping the practical benefits of science and technology in increasing energy efficiency, protecting the environment, and expanding our energy supply options. We need a more efficient process to transfer knowledge from the laboratory to the workshop and into the economy, that is, into our economy. In too many cases, other countries have taken greater advantage of U.S. taxpayer-funded research than we have. If we are to maintain our competitive edge as an economic power, we must move quickly, uh, then more quickly than we have in the past to adopt our knowledge to our practical needs. We will also need to do our utmost to encourage the training of competent people needed to run our future economy. We must reverse our dismal record of education and yet the product being scientifically and technologically illiterate. 
I believe it is time to bring the issue of science and engineering education to the forefront of our considerations. I intend to do so and hope Congress will support our efforts. And let me turn now to the matter of energy supplies, the fourth item. This nation produces and uses a great deal of energy, most of it domestic, but a good deal of it imported. Those participating in our NES process are particularly concerned about supplies of oil, natural gas, and electricity. On the oil side, we are reaching import levels that many people regard as worrisome. In 1989, our net imports represented 41 percent of the oil consumed. By net imports, let me uh, make sure we understand that uh, that is less than gross imports by about 5 percent. Present trends in domestic oil production and demand for oil virtually assure that even higher levels of import dependence will characterize the 90s. Viewed from the perspective that most future excess oil production capacity available to the U.S. and its allies will be in, a volatile, in volatile areas of the world, these trends pose serious challenges to our sense of energy security. Options available to increase domestic production are well known. They include better reflecting energy policy objectives and tax policy, developing better production technologies, and opening new areas for exploration and development. All of these options have advantages and disadvantages that need to be carefully weighed. Some represent very difficult choices for the nation to make, but these choices cannot be avoided for long. Even with these options, it is clear that oil imports will rise and domestic production will fall. I know, Mr. Chairman, that you have been concerned about the events of last winter, which led to a temporary period of sharply higher energy prices uh, for heating oils in the Northeast. I have been similarly concerned. It is important that we know how the fuel market functions and that we act promptly to anticipate and mitigate the effects of problems when they arise. And we are taking steps to do that in the lessons learned out of that event. One of the problems that is likely to arise in the 1990s is the adequacy of refinery capacity. The last new refinery to be built in the lower 48 was in 1981, and that one isn't even operating anymore. NES witnesses testified that as matters now stand, environmental requirements and public opposition to siting and construction of new refineries make it unlikely that we will ever construct another new refinery of any size in this country. At least 20 proposed refineries along the East Coast have been rejected in the last two decades by state and local jurisdictions for environmental reasons. If some of those refineries had been built, the additional capacity might have helped to alleviate last winter's product supply problems in the Northeast. In other words, we had the supplies, we did not have the distribution properly located. For electricity, we face a period of major adjustment and significant un uncertainty. One thing is certain, new electricity capacity will be needed in the de next decade to meet demand. We estimate that the nation will need about 100 additional gigawatts of generating capacity by the year 2000, even with aggressive demand side management efforts. Only about 40 percent of this new capacity is currently either under construction or the object of firm plans. Mr. Chairman, the hardest work on developing a national energy strategy is yet to come, as you pointed out. We are now embarked on an effort to narrow the options to those that merit our closest attention. A great deal of analysis will be undertaken in close consultation with other federal agencies and with the public. We also intend to conduct additional public hearings because we have an obligation to explain to the American people what we plan to do and why. And we are committed to a continuing dialogue with Congress. Hard choices will be required of both the administration and the Congress. Obtaining the energy we need to fuel a robust economy presents an increasingly difficult challenge. Doing so at reasonable cost while simultaneously achieving our objectives in the area of environment, health, safety, quality of life, and security will test in unprecedented ways our competence, our wisdom, and our ability to rise above partisan or regional interests. In conclusion, I am persuaded that unless we address our problems in a coherent, comprehensive manner, we shall not effectively address them at all. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, your committee members, and other members of Congress in building a national energy strategy of purpose, of relevance, and common sense. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That completes my oral statement. Mr. Secretary, the committee thanks you for your very helpful statement. The Chair is going to recognize members now in the order of their appearance, uh, starting with the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McMillan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
And uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. We appreciate you coming over this morning. Um, one of the things that it seems um, that we've been um, um, heavily engaged in over the last uh, year is Clean Air Act. And you made some reference to it in your statement with respect to its impact on CO2 emissions. But uh, to what extent has that been analyzed by your department as the bill now stands? And would you care to make any further comment on that? We have, uh, of course, tried uh, uh, to keep in tune with the progress here on Capitol Hill on the Clean Air Bill. Clean Air Bill will be an essential model uh, module to the National Energy Strategy, as will anything that comes out of Congress in the way of legislation on global climate change. Uh, this is similar to the chlorofluorocarbon elimination. So we are definitely monitoring all of this. We have not tried to pin down exactly what might happen were we to go certain ways specifically on the fast-moving uh, events here on Capitol Hill on the bill. But we do have some general feel. Uh, Ms. Stuntz's uh, people have been doing, trying to do the analysis to keep up with the various options on, on uh, CO2 emissions. We have a pretty good feel for acid rain. A contribution in the in the numbers of tons of SO2, NO2, and the like uh, that are eliminated there. Uh, less so, I think, in the area of CO2 generation. Uh, probably uh, because we have to know an awful lot uh, of interfacing uh, linkages between the various uh, options. But clearly, we're going to be reducing uh, CO2 generation, if nothing else, by the conservation that is driven by the pressures under Clean Air Bill. Probably more than almost anything else, because. As you know, we'll still be generating CO2 even with some alternatives uh, that we're using that are uh, less egregious in terms of their generation of greenhouse gases. But nevertheless, in balance, uh, we see the majority coming out of the conservation pressures from the Clean Air Bill uh, 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 rules themselves. Uh, Ms. Stunts, do you have any additional specific facts? Congressman McMillan, we do have some analysis of H.R. 3030 as originally proposed by the President, and we'd be pleased to provide detailed numbers on that for the record. I think that would be interesting because uh, I don't have the figures either, but I suspect that, uh, that its impact on, uh, on uh, the emission of gases that, that theoretically could uh, contribute to global warming is rather substantial, and yet it's re received very little uh, very little uh, publicity, I think. So I think that would be useful. But well, we certainly uh, agree that uh, uh, this is a key element because I believe to date, uh, while the administration has been criticized for in many, uh, from many vantage points that we are not doing enough in the area of global warming, I don't think there's any nation in the world that's done more. I think our investment is greater than all other nations of the world put together in, such, in, in areas of research. Uh, and so I think we're moving out aggressively with clean air bill, chlorofluorocarbon, with obviously greenhouse gases uh, being eliminated. So there are many things we're doing, along with forestation, uh, that fix the CO2 levels that, that do give us a movement in the right direction while we, while we finalize our scientific uncertainties uh, and pin them down and, and, and try to deal with them in a tech, from a technological point of view. So uh, we will give you the data on the specifics of 34. I don't know if we can... If we can uh, 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 unless you would specifically like us to evaluate certain alternatives, which we can do, it's a little bit hard to say what if. There's so many uh, changes that are possible in the CO2 emissions that might come out. But we could provide, I think, some Well, I, I realize there are a lot of, and a number of things we're doing in the bill create a competitive environment to develop alternative uh, right. sources of energy, but the outcome of which can't, cannot be predicted, any one of which would be positive or the combination of which would be positive. So I realize the difficulty. I just, the reason I raise it is I think it's important that the public have an understanding of that, not that it would influence the way the bill is going to go at this stage of the game, but uh, I think it would be uh, useful information as, as this bill uh, law becomes law and as it's implemented. We will provide you that information and any other, um, <clears throat> any other information we have at this point on our CO2 analysis of the Clean Air Bill. Just briefly, yes, sir. Please, 
The chair advised first we're going to go 10 minutes rather than five this morning for the members because of the character of the, of, of the issue at hand. And last of all, to observe that, Mr. Mr. Secretary, your comments related to uh, the bill as introduced was sent up by the administration. I think some comments with regard to the bills that were reported out of the committee uh, as well as the Senate bill would probably be of help to us in having some appreciation of the direction we're going. And I thank the gentleman for you. We'll provide both of those, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, some of the members of this committee were in um, Europe meeting with um, members of the European Parliament and we were discussing, among other things, trade and energy issues. And uh, some of them were contending that um, nuclear energy contributed to global warming, which was the first time I had heard that. Um, would you care to comment on that assertion? I don't, uh, I've never heard that one before. I've heard almost everything, uh, Mr. McMillan, but not that one. Uh, I hadn't either. I... <laughs> now, it does have a, uh, obviously, it, there's a obvious problem with waste uh, disposal. And to the extent uh, waste disposal uh, has some energy sources related to it, I suppose that uh, that component could be said to contribute to greenhouse gases. For example, if we have uh, power requirements uh, to, uh, to, uh, process fuels en route to a repository, for example, uh, it's conceivable that you could add that up and it would, be, uh, it would be a contribution. I think it's quite minor, and I don't really think that there's any real issue there that I know scientifically. Uh, it's, it's clearly uh, uh, does not generate uh, uh, greenhouse gases, and uh, the ancillary uh, issues that surround uh, production of materials and so forth could uh, for example, uh, uh, be a problem, such as at Paducah, we uh, enrich the uranium for commercial use. It has three major power plants that are coal-fired power plants. Uh, that requires uh, some 900 megawatts of electricity to run it at, at uh, capacity, and uh, therefore it's a contributor. So it, it, that may be what they're talking about. Well, turning that question around a little bit, which we did in that dialogue, uh, that if we could solve uh, the issue of nuclear waste one way or another, either by changing the, <clears throat> the process or, or finding a, a, a means of disposal, and dealing with some other safety issues, um, perhaps achieving a level of standardization, uh, would you care to comment a little further on the potential for nuclear power in terms of resolving a number of issues with right. respect to global warming, with respect to acid rain, et cetera? I think there's a growing feeling, even within the international community and the very green organizations, uh, uh, they're quite cautious now before running down nuclear power <clears throat> as an option. And so I see it as a potential uh, and essential ingredient to not only our national energy strategy, but the international energy uh, posture, without any question. Now, the issues that you raised are the, are the correct issue. In the first place, you have, to, you have to get investors willing to invest again. And that's not only in our own country, but in other countries. That means we have to have a streamlined licensing process, which we have now, uh, uh, we now see on the horizon. We have to have a more or less a simplified uh, design that is inherently safe. We have that on the horizon. <clears throat> we have to demonstrate that uh, American people, under those circumstances, are willing uh, to allow these sites to be built again at nominally, say, the 600 megawatt level, which is our current uh, review. We have two uh, major contracts uh, under the leadership of General Electric and Westinghouse out there today with a consortium in each case looking at, at the options for the pre-licensed uh, simplified design. Also, connected with that, we are doing research in the integrated fast reactor. The integrated fast reactor concept is one under the uh, aegis of Argonne National Laboratory using our experimental breeder reactor at Idaho. Uh, the combination there goes as follows. We believe it's quite clear now that we can burn up the actinides, which are the bad actors that make us go into a long-term repository, like 10,000 years or more. If we can eliminate the actinides, then we have a burial process that requires only 200 years. 200 years permits us then to keep this above ground until it decays below uh, tolerable levels at which time then it can be disposed of in, in, in fairly uh, ready fashion. So 
we are moving towards a new concept beyond the turn of the century that's not only advanced light water, but it has an integral fast reactor concept, about one plant for every five. So it generates power, but it also burns up the actinides from all the other uh, five plants with which it's associated. And that's a closed loop cycle. That is, you, you put the actinides into the advanced uh, uh, integrated fast reactor, and it keeps them in there until they're burned up. These are fissile materials primarily that are the actinides. So we do have a process to avoid the long-term repository follow-on to the Yucca Mountain uh, uh, situation, which is probably my most intractable issue. But I believe we will solve that with the opening of WIP this year. We'll send a signal that we know how to do these things. We'll be the first in the world with such a repository, and that we'll do it competently. Thank you. Is my time up? Um, Time of the gentleman has expired. Thank you. The uh, gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Bliley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to apologize for being late this morning. Amtrak was a little slow. Uh, I would like to ask unanimous consent to uh, make an opening statement. At, uh, Without objection, so ordered. I'm not going to give it. I just want to put it in the record. Without objection, so I know that so ordered. disappoints you, but anyway, we'll do that. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, Ms. Dunst, welcome to the committee. Uh, since last year, you've, you've had a large number of hearings and you've compiled this interim report. What do we know at the end of the process that we didn't know at the beginning? I think we have, uh, uh, Mr. Bliley, learned a lot. We found that the nation is very regionally oriented towards energy. Uh, while we could have gotten out of that out of the books, you have to go listen. Uh, for example, in the northwest of the country, clearly integrated resource planning or least cost utility planning, whatever you want to call it, is a major issue and has been for 10 years, and they've been doing a good job. Uh, Ex-former uh, Governor Evans has been uh, leading a group out there, and they actually do a very good job of looking ahead to their power needs and trying to balance them off with uh, conservation efficiencies and other approaches to avoid uh, the unnecessary generation of new power plants. Now, in my opinion, uh, they've probably uh, been a little remiss in not being a little more aggressive because I think they're going to have some power shortage problems. Uh, Bonneville Power Authority, which is, uh, provides a large amount of their resource, is uh, down in the margins that are available for future expansion. So there has to be some uh, aggressive look now as to what they're going to do for the next decade. They do that well. And they're 70 percent hydro-powered up there. Now, you go down to uh, Kentucky, and it's coal. And it's high sulfur coal, and it's low sulfur coal. And they don't care that much about hydro. And so they have a different outlook. What are the barriers to them? What are the in inabilities for their rural cooperatives to get into transmission lines? Uh, and so they become very concerned about that as you move into Texas. Uh, Texas is getting very realistic about uh, the, uh, the dwindling supplies of natural uh, reserves in oil and, and looking towards natural gas and nuclear. They have, a, I think, a very progressive uh, approach to energy. Uh, up in the Northeast, a totally different story. The Northeast uh, is basically an importer of energy. Not enough gas, not uh, happy with nuclear, uh, import 100 percent of their oil. Uh, they're way above the national average in oil generating electricity by about seven or eight to, to one. Uh, they have not come to grips, in my opinion, with the energy projections for that part of the country. And they have to do their share. The federal government can be chastised for a lot of things, but can't be chastised for everything. I mean, uh, let, let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, what they're asking for now in, in petroleum res uh, uh, strategic reserves up there. And the question is, will the American people pay for their decisions of the past to avoid having refineries and energy sources in their region? These are big issues, and they all have to be addressed in our national energy policy to set some direction for the country so that people can share these burdens. They're, they're not all, uh, you, you can't just stand back and uh, demand import from Canada, from the South, from the West, from all other parts of the country, and not participate yourself a little bit in some of the agony associated with environmental concern. Now, we've learned those by going around the country. And the Southeast is a totally different kind of a region. Uh, they're, they're extremely concerned down there about uh, the future of the southeast ability to uh, extract uh, um, coal bed methane, for example. 
Uh, is it going to be environmentally impossible for them to take advantage of the trillions of cubic feet of coal bed methane available? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's going to be tough. So these will all be laid out in the National Energy Strategy, and these are things we did not know back here. Maybe we should have, and maybe they're in some documents, uh, but constituency issues uh, that come to the fore from the most, at, uh, most uh, aggressive groups are kind of the ones we have on file. And the ones from the little people out there that have been crying and not being heard, such as in uh, uh, regulatory procedures that would, would uh, preclude uh, any ad additional uh, repowering of existing hydro uh, turbines on existing dams, not building any new dams, uh, they're very concerned about it. They just don't want to relicense anymore. It's too hard. Six or seven year relicensing process with regulatory barriers that you could line up across that whole bulkhead up there. Now, these are the things we've learned by going out. It's been very advantageous, I think, to also uh, educate those people in the regions that these are tough issues and they're going to have to be brought into balance. And I frankly see some, some beneficial uh, fallout from those hearings uh, by all sides, that everybody's going to have to give a little bit uh, so that we can come out with everybody equally unhappy when we finish. <laughs> in your testimony, you stated that uh and I quote, we have allowed NARA interest to determine the agenda. Would you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, let me just say in general terms, I think what has happened, if, as we look back on where we are today and where perhaps we should be, uh, that we do see uh, a number of energy babies thrown out with the uh, reduced oil price bathwater back in the early part of this decade. Uh, when the oil prices dropped, we eliminated an awful lot of research, an awful lot of pressures on looking ahead for the future of the country. And you can look in energy 40 years ahead. So there are not any very many new issues. Uh, we're raising all these today because we're facing, frankly, a crisis in energy. Uh, and so I believe that what happened there in the past, certainly past eight years, I think that we have or 10 years in the last decade, we have not given the attention we should have for the long haul and looked at how we're going to manage our, our, our natural resources in the country, how we're going to integrate those with environmental concerns. Frankly, the Department of Energy has been one of the villains, as you know. You've been reading about us in, in the paper on environmental considerations. And they have bogged us down now with uh, RECRA rules and others that have changed over this same decade. We hadn't kept up with it and hadn't looked ahead to find the balance between environment and energy and science and economics. Uh, so I think that uh, when, the, uh, when the, oil, uh, the wheel squeaked, we put oil on it to the best we could over this period of time. But frankly, in aggregate, we see a very fragmented energy posture. Not enough conservation, not enough efficiency, uh, not enough balance between these things in attention to uh, the things nuclear. We haven't moved aggressively enough. By the year 2000, we'll have our next plant. That will be 22 years since the last technology put a plant out there in the United States which invented the stuff. So I think these are the, these are the, uh, the kind of the reasons for the uh, lack of attention in the 80s. Things were going along all right. Oil prices were down. Gasoline at the pump was there. And uh, I think we were complacent, frankly, and uh, only allowed a piecemeal approach to this. In the meantime, we've allowed uh, regulations to uh, be increased significantly. Uh, this is raising question on stripper well survival, uh, that, for example, in, uh, in, for environmental reasons. And, and these all may be legitimate, but we haven't faced up to it. So we've gotten ourselves so stumbled into this decade, I think, with uh, a very fragmented and sad picture about our inability to grasp the whole on energy, environment, science, and, and economy. Following up uh, on uh, some questions of my colleague from North Carolina, uh, you have advanced uh, recently the innovative idea of building uh, not large but medium-sized uh, nuclear power plants in the 650 megawatt range. Uh, and you've stated that these would be standardized in design and subject to a streamlined license process. Would you uh, discuss this and relate how it might relate to the uh, or differ from the French system of licensing power plants? Uh, 
Uh, I think the French concept is similar. I'm trying to uh, refresh my mind on just what, uh, what France's approach is. I think we're very similar. Let me con uh, answer the question on what, what this is all about, and then I'll ask Ms. Stunt if she has an upgraded uh, picture on the French uh, system. There isn't any question that uh, we had a, an accident at Three Mile Island uh, that uh, resulted from, uh, frankly, a uh, non-professional uh, approach to duties and things nuclear. Uh, coming from the nuclear Navy, I know how things have to be run right and how you have to keep the margin of safety well clear of the bottom edge of acceptability so it never gets down to that region. That's tough. It's costly, requires tremendous oversight, in, independent and internal, as well as in the line management function. So coming out of that, the, it was very clear that in the future for this to be a, a palatable system that we would have to find a better way to allow a power plant to get into trouble by itself without any external power and save itself from any kind of damages to employees or the local community. Uh, technology has permitted us to do that. Uh, natural circulation proposals, including air cooling and the like, have all, will all be designed into this system. It will be a below ground system. Uh, it will have uh, the ability to generate full power uh, to drop off the line without any external support and not uh, not throw radionuclides into the environment. Uh, that, that takes a lot of technical know-how to design the cores that way, design the plants that way. So that has been done. The 650 power level, is, megawatt level, is about what is uh, industry thinks they, uh, they want. I think too often we can talk about 1,350 megawatt plants, one of which we have under design in this very same program. But I don't know if we have any industry right now that, that are considering uh, investing in such a plant. It's too big. It will have to go through all the environmental impact studies in the local area, and those large plants just are not that attractive anymore. But 650 seems to be about the range. So the power is right, the containment is right, and more importantly, the simplified design is right, because one of the things that we're seeing out there is the maintenance and operating costs of nuclear power plants are going up rather exponentially. So it's time now for the next generation to come along and knock that way back down. And that can be done with a modernized design, and that's factored into our criteria. And I believe those costs will be brought back to be competitive. Uh, as far as I know, the French system is uh, 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 quite similar. Uh, they don't have to have the individual design reviews we have, perhaps, but, uh, uh, and I don't know what, they don't know the inner workings of their system over there to know what that really means, but obviously it's a more streamlined approach. We in the Department of Energy now that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has taken their approach to, to the single licensed, uh, pre-licensed plant, single design, we are now looking to see whether or not we need to go further and ask Congress for additional streamlining if, in fact, industry is not going to be willing to invest under the current situation. And there's some a question out there whether they feel that we've gone far enough and yet we don't want to go so far as to turn off the American people on the concept uh, by not allowing the kinds of uh, continuing oversight as the plant actually gets built and goes online. We want to know that it's being uh, built according to specs and all of the pre-licensed criteria that we establish. So I think we can find that compromise and aid in a six to seven year uh, recovery on investment instead of a 14 year recovery. Uh, do you have any other comments on the French uh, system, Mr. Time, time? I would only add, Mr. Mulally, that I, one of the key elements of the success of the French in building nuclear power plants appears to be the widespread use of a very small number of pre-approved designs, which are then replicated again and again. And I think that's what we're trying to do here by getting approved a couple of designs which can then be repeated and so as to avoid the, the continual relitigation and the sort of the, the, the unique crafting of a nuclear plant uh, as if it were the first time around for every site. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's something uh, I believe the French do at this time, is it not? That's correct. Yes, but and they also seems... have, the French have a serious waste problem, too. I mean, we talk about vitrification, their facility at Marcoul, and I've been there. Uh, but they also have a long-term repository problem, and they're trying to find uh, six sites now, all of which have been turned down by local referenda. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty common to all of us. No one has a long-term repository yet. We will have our first for defense waste uh, at, uh, in New Mexico, and I hope that we will be able to get on with the characterization of the site at Yucca to determine whether or not we really do have a capability to store waste that long and guarantee uh, their security. 
You've raised in your last comment the two points. The first is that the French do have a, have a system of replicating c common design of plants. Yes. It works. Yes. They have a nuclear waste problem, as do we. You've indicated our New Mexico program is going on, and the Yucca Flats uh, for, the, for the civilian waste generated by the nuclear power plants is going right. forward. I gather there are problems with both of those, Mr. Secretary. Would you want to describe them briefly for us, please? Uh, the problems are, uh, are serious, uh, not technical, but they're serious in all other areas, the socioeconomic issues, uh, the whole issue of can, how can we prove anything can last 10,000 years, uh, how do we know there's not going to be migration of the salt in an area that could take uh, uh, not the radioactive but the toxic materials at, uh, at uh, Carlsbad, New Mexico into aquifers and the like? How do we know that somebody 10,000 years from now uh, wouldn't drill down in there and, and get some radioactive gas released? Uh, so you have the most, probably the most complicated EIS process that we've ever had. Uh, no migration petition has never been uh, conducted by the EPA before. We have given them extensive resources to help them, uh, and it looks like we're going to have our first <clears throat> decision on that uh, this summer, sufficient to make some uh, estimates as to when we might open for research work, uh, and we believe it's going to be this fall. Uh, so we, 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 uh, we, have, we have a lot of scientific technical problems that have never been done before, but we're going to solve those, but they take time. And uh, until I got there, frankly, we didn't have a plan. We didn't have an integrated plan. There's some 26 very significant items that all have to be integrated together. Those were not integrated in a plan. Uh, the same thing at, at Yucca Mountain. We have, for the first time, put out a Yucca Mountain plan that makes some sense. And when we laid it out, the politically driven startup by 2003 didn't make any sense. It just cannot get there from here. And we have to be realistic about, about the political uh, uh, obstacles. We are now in two court cases. Uh, the state of Nevada versus Watkins is one. I'm not all that proud of that, but uh, we have one of those going. And then we have Watkins versus the state of Nevada, which I'm very proud of. Uh, <laughs> so, so we have uh, incredible problems associated with not in my backyard storage of these uh, uh, nuclear waste. We're seeing it in the area of low-level waste. The states have that responsibility and trying to pull together consortium is a very rough, very rough sledding for them. Uh, and I think a lot of it stems from, uh, frankly, uh, uh, the lack of demonstration on the part of the Department of Energy that we have the technical and professional know-how to do these things responsibly so the American people can feel comfortable that when we say something, uh, it's correct. And we haven't done all that well in that regard. And I think that this this uh, opening of WIP this year with, I think, something like five different external oversight bodies, including state, National Academy of Sciences, National Research Council, you name it, uh, will come to grips with the technical issues that I think will, will stand us in good stead as we face the commercial repository at Yucca Mountain. And, uh, and I hope that we'll be able to win our court case. The Congress has legislated it'll go there. The state has said, no, it won't. And so we have to resolve that. Uh, perhaps even at the Supreme Court level this year. And I hope that uh, the court case now proceeding in the Ninth Circuit Court in San Francisco uh, will be expeditiously handled. We've been told it will. We hope to have uh, the initial hearings in August with resolution this fall. That will be very, very helpful. And then I believe the, the rhetoric will calm down and that we'll get on with our scientific work in a responsible way with total involvement of state and other external officials that want to come in. And in fact, we'll even pay for some of that to have that done, the, the, the supercomputer put in in the university and so forth, to really do a first class job on, on characterizing that site to see if it can uh, survive. And then the schedule opening is not until the year 2010, and we can, uh, we can hold on until about the turn of the century when we must have then an interim MRS concept, the uh, monitored retrievable storage somewhere in the country because there will be about 26 power plants that will exceed their on base storage capacity in the pools they now have for the spent fuel elements. So these are the real obstacles we face on waste uh, disposal. And uh, we have a plan now that is integrated. Uh, it's uh, reviewed by external oversight groups. We think it's a good plan. The National Academy has told us that they think it's a good plan now and that we're paying attention to what we ought to be paying attention to. And that will take us, I think, well into the next century then with that behind us as a major obstacle until such time as we get fusion. What do you anticipate the, the dates for the completion of the litigation relative to the 
Nevada site to be? By uh, this, uh, late this fall. Will that, will that include potential for appeal to the Supreme Court? No, sir, that will be just out of the Ninth Circuit. But we believe our case is very, very strong there and that uh, we hope that that will be the end of it. Mr. Secretary, one of the lessons of the December coal snap was the inter interdependence of our three major energy markets, oil, natural gas, and electricity. During December, all three markets were very tight. Some pessimistic analysis, analysis would lead us to believe that we may be headed for some kind of a triple witching hour for energy in the mid-1990s, where oil, natural gas, and electric markets will be tight simultaneously for a sustained period of time. Uh, th there are many reasons that this could occur, weather being only one. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this as a potential problem and its extent? And what policies can be undertaken to avoid this possibility or to mitigate its effects? Oh, we're very concerned about it, Mr. Chairman. I think it's probably the one of the most uh, important catalysts that drives the national energy strategy development. I don't think there's any question about it that the electricity margins are down. Uh, there's different projections on, on uh, when the, uh, the brownouts will occur at a greater rate or blackouts, but I think under any circumstances we're looking at something after 92 as being a, a very dicey situation in particularly the northeast part of the country on electricity without any question. I think we're also seeing the concern about uh, increasing oil imports. Uh, witness a debate just on the sizing of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, people feel that that's uh, absolutely essential that we uh, increase that further to uh, and give me additional flexibility or the present additional flexibility on under certain circumstances even before we would have a uh, uh, an international problem overseas on a on a uh, on a uh, uh, shaky supply of oil uh, so that we we do see a great concern as we go around the country there's no question about it on oil and gas we see pipeline problems in gas that are very severe uh, and great opposition to putting in new gas pipelines for a variety of reasons. Now, none of those things bode very well uh, for the future, and I hope that the National Energy Strategy will lay out these things in specific enough terms so that the American people can read this document and look at the alternatives they have uh, to continuing pressures to avoid uh, the energy they need in their own regions. And that we can lay it out and say, well, all right, if you make the decision not to bring a new gas pipeline, if you make the decision to keep the regulatory barriers there, if you make the decision that you're not going to go nuclear and you don't care about 100 percent import of oil, that's okay by you, then you have to face some of these consequences. And I think that's going to be an important contribution that I hope the energy strategy makes. And we'll have an annex in there with about seven or so scenarios that let people walk through their own options. If, if we're going to, we have no alternative to uh, to oil demand for the foreseeable future despite efficiencies and conservations and alternative fuels, and you're still going to need oil, we have to make a decision whether we believe offshore and ANWR is critical, whether we believe that uh, federal involvement and expanded uh, enhanced oil recovery through things like horizontal drilling are important. And I think the energy strategy final document will have that in there, and you'll see us then try to lean on that document to come forward with legislative effort working with the Hill to see if we can't uh, level the playing field, if you will, across the energy sources. Uh, but uh, electricity uh, uh, margins, we know are down. Refineries, uh, pipelines are full capacity. We don't have enough refineries, and I mentioned that in my speech. And the gas market is facing new demands from the Clean Air uh, Bill, which will be uh, rather severe demand against the uh, whatever you consider to be the, uh, the waning resource of natural gas in our natural resource inventory. Uh, some people have estimated 40 years, some 100, uh, some more than that, saying there's much more there. We just haven't gotten it out yet. But at any rate, it will put heavy demands on gas, and that's good on the one hand, but worrisome as a, a finite resource on the other. Mr. Secretary, uh, the, um, it is clear that nuclear power is going to be a, an important energy source for the United States. I, the Clean Air Act has compelled me to come to the conclusion that the United States simply must move forward now with a nuclear option. Um, there is a major confidence problem, as you very well understand. Uh, the, in time past, and I say this largely because you were here 
the performances of your predecessor in DOE under that agency had not instilled the kind of confidence, and nor has the performance of NRC with regard to the safety and other important questions here. You are making, in my view, a massive effort and a successful one to abate the confidence crisis which exists. But how can the public have confidence that nuclear power can be used in a responsible and reasonably safe matter, or manner? You, would, uh, you could probably address this from the standpoint of safety, disposal of wastes, uncertainty in licensing, regulatory process, and uncertainty about power plant performance, economics, and, of course, the financial risk. Well, I, um, I try to uh, summarize my views on that uh, earlier, Mr. Chairman. I think that the one element that you raised that I haven't touched on in the past is are we going to have the human resources sufficient to do this and all the other things in the country technologically? As you know, the demands for uh, individuals who actually operate nuclear power plants is very severe. The shortage is very severe. I think if I had to say the long pole in the tent on nuclear, it was not technical, it was not going to be repository, it's not going to be design, it's going to be human beings. Uh, we have to start educating the base of American people in things technical. We're going to put a, a space station out there, we're going to make a trip to, uh, to uh, Saturn and Mars, we're going to uh, have SDI. Uh, we're going to have a very sophisticated but smaller military, as I understand the strategists are thinking today. Uh, everybody has to be a computer expert in society just to survive at a fast food, food place if you're going to work there. Uh, so we're getting very technical as a nation and we simply don't have the resources. Uh, and 85 percent of, uh, of the young people entering the workforce by the year 2000 will be women and minority. And they are the least uh, interested in these areas. So we have a very serious problem that is generating underneath all of the other technical and economic concerns that I think will be even more severe. So I would add that to the issues on nuclear, but I would not pin nuclear down as the only uh, problem in that regard. I think it's across all technical areas, and that's why you're seeing us embark in the Department of Energy and trying to take the lead within the federal government to get on to a, an effort to carry out the National Governors Association, the President's goal on being number one in the, in the world by the year 2000 in our young people entering the workforce, be competitive not be uh, outside the top ten in all six disciplines in science as we are today and that sort of thing. So I would say that any help you can give us in that regard will not only bode well for the country as a whole, but specifically give us the capability we need to manage these nuclear power plants. And I've, I've asked the Armed Services Committees and the other committees I've come before to please help us as the new OPM guidelines come on professional uh, pay for uh, uh, a career civil service that we have some waiver capability on dual compensation, that we have some additional critical positions assigned so that I can get the skills. And if I can do that, then I believe we can show the American people that we know what we're doing. And I believe DOE has, has to take that lead, even though I think commercial power sector has done a superb job. I really do over uh, the interim 10-year period from Three Mile Island. While we were asleep, they were working. And, uh, and they've done a good job. Their, their average performance is significantly higher than it was at the time of Three Mile Island. By, by significantly, I mean like uh, two orders of magnitude. If I, can, if I could grade them back then, I'd say they're probably close to C minus. And I think they're getting close to B plus right now. And that's good uh, for the country. But we, by letting them down on this uh, in the defense side, have again raised the issue of our competence to manage uh, such a program. And I think that's really more at stake here than all the technical and all the other, other issues combined. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. My time has expired. The gentleman from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, let me uh, go back to uh, process just a little bit. The uh, report uh, issued this month, uh, interim report, um, is uh, it's billed as a compilation of public uh, comments. How, how do you foresee moving from this stage into, uh, into the development of a strategy, into the, uh, the development of pro policy and, and legislative proposals? I think what you're seeing in that report uh, along those lines, Mr. McMillan, goes something like this. The table of context and the chapters, if you will, are the chapters that will appear in our proposal to the President. I think that's pretty clear that we've, 
we've come <laughs> down on that format as being a useful format with which we can put all of the information that we've uh, uh, divined from this effort. We recognize in there that we have diametrically opposed uh, obstacles as viewed by many groups out there and diametrically opposed options to address those obstacles. Uh, those we're going to have to analyze. And so the analysis has started. Uh, and uh, we're doing that through the interagency process of the Economic uh, Policy Council. Uh, that has a working group chaired by my deputy but involves all agencies in the government. And that, by the way, those were the same agencies involved in allowing the interim report to come out as, as it came out. We have already come down on in, in areas that surround energy efficiency and conservation, uh, renewables, uh, uh, education, national energy modeling system, and several others. Uh, those are now being uh, worked by the interagency group uh, to finalize them as uh, being suitable for inclusion in our final report to the President. We have not come down on the tough options. How much oil, how much gas, how much nuclear, how much uh, uh, conservation and renewables, and how much does it cost, and uh, do you have the science to support it? So what's happening now, April and May, we're narrowing options. We're conducting the analysis of the options, and by that I mean we have to have solid documentation in hand, where the analysis uh, can be reviewed. We're not just taking opinions of people that have no substantive uh, underpinnings. So we're looking at all of our documents. We have some thousand documents uh, and studies from a variety of sources across the nation. All those are now being placed under uh, analytic review. Then we'll have interagency staff working groups to review and comment on the options as completed. By options, we mean options to eliminate the actual or perceived obstacles to moving into an efficient and balanced energy regime for the nation uh, to give us uh, energy at acceptable cost without uh, damage to the environment, severe damage to the environment. Now, in June to August, then, we're going to review the public comment on the interim report. We've asked in our forwarding letter to Congress and others to please give us uh, answers to these questions, the extent to which the report surrounds the issues, the adequacy of the stated goals and identified obstacles, and the completeness of the range of options. Have we left out anything? This is what we're asking now, and the comments are beginning uh, to come in. Uh, so we hope in June to August to rationalize those and place them into the final uh, package for our uh, review. Then we're going to hold additional public hearings and workshops to collect comments and options and analysis. And that will be, I think, very important. And we don't know exactly what that will be yet, but we know we're going to have to go out and hear some more uh, particularly when we get into some of these very specific areas of regulatory barriers. Uh, we're going to complete the analysis in August and identify the options then that we think are the right ones for the interagency group to consider. Then from September to October, the interagency staff and senior level working groups will conduct their final review and analysis of the option. This is where uh, it's going to get tough and the rubber is going to hit the road because by this time we're now encroaching on territories. Uh, one on the other and so forth. And we hope to be able to say that all energy sources have potential use in this country. We can't throw them out. We need to manage them well technologically. And if we have the scientific stuff to do that, then they need to be kept in the equation. Uh, we also have to worry a lot about the environment. And we have, of course, chlorofluorocarbon elimination, clean air bill, and whatever then is evolving out of the IPCC network on global climate change. If global climate change is not handled properly, I can t and we make premature judgments, uh, not on the basis of science or economics, but on other emotional issues uh, this year, <clears throat> then we will do severe damage and almost uh, obviate the need for a national energy strategy. Because it could well become the national energy strategy. In other words, if a, if a tax on CO2 now is levied, uh, then there are some bills over here that might do that, uh, I would say that would be very premature and unfortunate for the nation. Because then everything is driven by that. And all of these other things I'm talking about are really become quite irrelevant. So I think we have to be very cautious that we allow the IPCC process to work uh, with total openness and involvement by the U.S., and then we have to make U.S. decisions, and I would hope that we'd be able to hold off on anything that would be substantive in that regard and premature this year and allow this process to work and let us get our energy strategy on the street, and we will be ready to absorb anything in the way of legislation on uh, global climate change at that point in time. Right now, I think it would be chaotic uh, to throw 
uh, a, a fixed uh, date and target and percent reduction or stabilization of greenhouse gas by year 2005 or 2000. Whatever uh, come out as a simple fix could be devastating to building a logical strategy built, we hope, from the base up on the base of sound science and economics as well as environment and energy needs. In November, the sets of options will be approved by the senior interagency group and that has to be done by the 15th so it can be reflected as appropriate in the 92 budget submission to Congress. Uh, we have set this timing up purposely so that we uh, can allow the 92 budget to reflect a, a change in course, you might say, in the national energy strategy. And, and hopefully then in December we'll get to the president and sometime between January and March, uh, he'll have to decide what the timing is. Uh, we would hope it would come out and it will be our first report to Congress in compliance with the congressional direction uh, to give them a biennial report on the national energy policy, which we have been doing religiously for 10 years, but nobody's paid any attention to it because it's not been an action plan. And it's just been a lot of motherhood statements and nobody has paid any attention to it. So I think this is going to be a different plan. This is going to recommend legislative change, going to recommend states do certain things, change in incentive packages, uh, a lot of things that are going to be different. And we, we plan to make those recommendations. And hopefully we'll make it on the base of sound analysis and a rather thorough national involvement with some hope that it will survive. So that is the administrative process we're following. And all of the interagency work is done through the Economic Policy Council, which is basically chaired by the Secretary of Treasury. But the working group will be doing most of the work until we finally get to the, uh, to the uh, last stages of decision before we go to the President. And, of course, one of, the, uh, one of the more difficult aspects of dealing with something like clean air legislation is overcoming regional differences, which we all understand and I think have done a reasonably good job of doing in the, in the bill that was adopted by the House or by the committee. Would you, uh, we perhaps are going to have some tougher options in, in what you're going to be dealing with in terms of uh, uh, the regional aspects of those options. Uh, how are you basically going to address that in, in the context of, uh, of, of what may be national legislation? Are you going to attempt to build into the legislation? Are you going to attempt to build into the legislation um, a means whereby a given state can exercise those choices? Uh, the President has directed us to enhance marketplace response. That is, that we're supposed to find the barriers to, that now preclude marketplace from driving in the proper direction. So we're going to have to find out those obstacles to marketplace response. Uh, he feels very strongly about this, and we feel very strongly, and we'll, we're, we're gearing ourselves up to uh, incentivize the marketplace to do certain things and provide maximum flexibility to the states to do that, not unlike the, the approach that the President took in, in dealing with the Clean Air Bill proposal. Try to find the maximum flexibility and give them options to select those, uh, uh, those approaches that, that are re then regionally make sense regionally. I think that's the way we have to do it. So the regional sensitivity will uh, be uh, manifested in the way we have eliminated ob obstacles to marketplace and given incentive to the states to select certain options. Uh, that optimize their regional approach to energy. We're, we're not digging any knives in the secretary. Nor do in terms of what our, let's say, expectations, expectations might be, um, in considering the advantages of having a national energy strategy, um, if we had had one in the past, in your judgment, would we now uh, have a licensed uh, nuclear power plant at Shoreham sitting idle? I don't think we would have. I really do believe that um, they capitalized on an unfortunate time in, uh, in this, uh, at the end of this past decade uh, where we were a bit in chaos on this issue. And uh, we're not doing well in uh, both the defense and the non-defense side on waste. Uh, there's great controversy about radioactive waste even at low level storage sites that the states run. So I think it was an unfortunate time uh, to to, uh, uh, to, to close an operating power plant fully licensed. As you know, it had been operating at 5 percent power for nearly two years. Uh, so I, I do believe that that was a, a tragic outcome of a decade of inattention uh, to the very thing that we're up here addressing today. Uh, now, 
Could you have had an energy strategy 10 years ago? I don't think so. I think we are now in extremists uh, on the situation, and that is unfortunately the way we always do things. I think we are extremists on clean air, and I think we had to come to grips with the nation, and the Hill has indicated the abil uh, ability up here under these circumstances to be flexible and to, and to share burdens. And I think that, that that bodes well for the timing on this national energy strategy. Uh, I don't think it could have been done 10 years ago. Uh, I'm sorry, it, it should have been done 10 years ago, but could it have been? And anybody paying attention? I doubt it. I thank the Secretary. Chair, sure, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, gentleman from Virginia. Well, Mr. Secretary, following up on the gentleman again from North Carolina's question, how will having a national energy strategy prevent debacles such as Shoreham? I don't think we can ever prevent something that uh, seems to me uh, to be born out of uh, recalcitrance uh, to a process that says, uh, look, let's come together and talk. Uh, let's make the evacuation plan work. Let's try to make it work. Uh, in absent, absent that, I don't see how we can, uh, we can uh, dictate that from the Federal level. All we can do is try to put pressure on the system to say that you don't have many alternatives in this world, and uh, that happened to be a good alternative. Modern technology, well-run plant, fully licensed, already operating, desperately needed in the region because their electricity starved and yet uh, shut down. I, I can't track it. I think it's totally illogical. And hopefully that when we have a national energy strategy that says there is a logical place for nuclear power to play, that there can be political pressures brought to bear and congressional and even state legislative uh, uh, pressure brought to bear to say, come on, uh, give us an alternative. What are you looking for? Uh, are we going to get a coal-fired plant in an area that uh, already in non-attainment? No. Is it going to be easy to get the gas pipelines in? No. Are we going to demand more import from Canada that's beginning to close out the Northeast on electricity because they're concerned about additional hydro? Uh, we, we can't keep demanding others to provide our energy when we're not willing ourselves to face things like refineries, uh, like going through the the difficult process of getting additional pipeline, uh, and that's not uh, fully negotiated up there now. There's three pipelines that look like they've responded favorably to the initial to the request, but it's not, not going to be adequate still. So, these are the things I hope the strategy will at least get on the table, and everybody else can say, "Oh, come on, New York, let's get Shore back on the line, and quit hauling up your electricity from your area, from the southeast of the country. We're bringing in." things now from the western side of Pennsylvania to the east uh, to support the eastern grid. The eastern grid needs help. And why does it need help? It's being drained. And uh, I think people have to share some of these burdens, and I hope this will expose the need for equality, you might say, in, in dealing with energy sources, cutting down demand where possible, and sharing these things across the country, since we're really well, quite well integrated, and certainly from electrical transmission lines, this side of the Rockies. Well. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more, Admiral, and, and I hope that uh, what you say happens, but uh, absent a crisis, I don't see it happening. Uh, this body is a reactive body. We don't lead very often, and that's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony the near impossibility of building oil refineries well, on the East Coast, I guess anywhere uh, in the United States. Uh, because of environmental requirements and, and public opposition. How will a national energy strategy uh, help get these refineries built? May I ask uh, Ms. Stunts to uh, respond to that, uh, Mr. Sure. Lindley? I, I can only echo what the Secretary has just said, because it, it really has broader applicability. I think if, if you are in an area that has chosen, for whatever reason, not to have a refinery, there needs to be an explanation of the consequences of that choice. You're, you become at the end of the pipeline. You become a lot more subject to interruptions. And if, uh, if the choice was not to put a refinery there, then that may be good. But there will be times that you will be more vulnerable to problems just because you become much more dependent on the infrastructure. Uh, more, I guess, more de in more detail, we would hope to expose, as the Secretary said, the details of, of the regulations, whether they are federal, state, or local, that make siting a refinery so difficult. Certainly matters to be addressed in the Clean Air Act are important, uh, and they need to be addressed in a comprehensive, uh, rational way. If, for example, we expect refineries to produce large amounts of new cleaner fuels, 
but make it difficult for them to get the permits to reconfigure the refineries because they may be in non-attainment areas, these things will, will come at counter purposes and we will not succeed in either purpose. And so that needs to get laid out so we don't have those kinds of inadvertent inconsistencies and can at least see what choices are, are there. Well, uh, Admiral, Ham, what is the percentage of oil we're now importing? I don't uh, know the current month date. The data I gave in my statement was, uh, was uh, net, which is uh, import minus exported refined products. Uh, it, it was on the average, I believe, at the end of the year, about 46 percent. Now, we've had monthly numbers that, as you know, exceeded 50 percent. Uh, January was uh, 54 percent, which would be gross, about 49 percent net. Uh, so it's clearly going up. And uh, we would agree with the chairman who has made some recent statements about the fact that we could go up as high as 60 percent uh, gross import or higher by the end of the decade. We have a voracious appetite. I'm not announcing any approval for that situation. No, no. I'm just, I'm just no, no, you're announcing the fact. No, you were not happy in that statement. I recognize that. But well, we're talking about that's a serious problem. When well, it comes to economic, I think the security threat is, could well be become more economic than military. And we've seen the military issue. Uh, I believe that's relatively benign in our projections as opposed to economic threat. I, I would tend to agree, but as we continually see uh, offshore regions being denied for drilling, uh, California, uh, East Coast, Alaska, uh, now talk of doing the same in Florida. Uh, won't that exacerbate your problem in, in trying to get a national energy po policy? And won't that exacerbate the problem of uh, imports uh, causing our balance of payments to, to rise and making us much more vulnerable to disruption since most of the oil that we get comes from a, a highly unstable politically uh, area and areas. Well, I don't know uh, how the President will come down on the task force uh, uh, information he received on the three sites. There are three sites, as I recall, two off California, one off Florida. Uh, and I'm not sure how that's all going to come out. I would not want to prejudge the President's decision. I think all we can do is say, look, here is what the prospectus is for offshore gas and oil for the country. Here's the perspective and the length of time that uh, ANWR can help out. If you don't do these things, then you have to face these alternatives. Significant economic, negative economic impact, alternative sources that may or may not be available, and just a jawbone about efficiencies and conservation without knowing what you're talking about in terms of quads of energy. For example, by the year 2000 or a little after, it's possible for us to save two quads of energy, let's say 30,000 megawatts. But we're going to demand 110,000 megawatts uh, for the nation at a nominal growth of about 2.5 percent gross national product. So we have to give in this report then enough information so that people can face the alternatives uh, rather than just do it on the basis of goodness or, or VISTA or something like that. And uh, so we're not quick to run at this point in time to that conclusion, but I can guarantee you it's under, under a severe focus. And this is why we've shifted our whole research in oil to applied research now, not long-term risk research. We have to help industry doing everything we can now to avoid the loss of our stripper wells, 6,000 of them. And we certainly don't want to start losing those because there's potential in there for horizontal drilling application. And once those wells go down for any reason, they're lost. And this is providing 53 percent of our oil in the country. So these are the things we have to, to explain sufficiently in there so you all up here can nod and say that's about right. That's where you're going to have to find alternatives. Uh, and so uh, we, we have to be cautious before we throw away oil too, too prematurely here. We don't have all the answers uh, yet on oil. And, uh, and so reformulated gasolines and all those things will probably be here for some time to come. And oxygen it's and all the things we're going to do to gasoline. Uh, but this, uh, I don't see the United States, I don't see anybody clamoring for a reduced standard of living. I, I haven't heard I haven't that yet. I haven't found any either, Admiral. And so we have to get them, I have to get these same advocates uh, tuned in on the alternatives that are realistic. So hopefully we'll do that. And oil is obviously uh, one of the uh, uh, scarce commodities in this country. And uh, we've got to be cautious before we throw away uh, the... Uh, 
the, uh, the billions of barrels of oil reserve on annual. We think we can do those kinds of things in an uh, environmentally sound way. We don't have to uh, accept uh, great damage. Uh, whether we can do that or not or whether we should do it or not will be a national decision, but at least we'll have some alternatives on the table to say, all right, this is what you, this is what you might see. Uh, same with gas pipelines from the north down. We're talking about opening up a contract now uh, with one of the uh, gas companies there in Alaska for the export of liquid natural gas to the Pacific Rim nations uh, to be competitive. Uh, it's uh, because we have the resources uh, to do that. Uh, it seems to make sense to us to allow that to happen. It would be a very big contribution to the strength of our, our Pacific uh, Rim neighbors and, and, uh, and to carry out some of the national strategic objectives. Uh, so all that is going to be in this energy strategy document that uh, I hope will give us the answers to why these things uh, are important or, in fact, if you reject them, then you have alternatives or, in fact, if you reject them, you may not have any alternatives. And you, and you better be cautious to know then of what it means to a gross national product or a national economic uh, decline. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Secretary, um, you've discussed briefly the question of oil. Um, is it fair to say that the cost of oil at this time impacts on exploration, reworking of wells, uh, secondary and tertiary recovery, and also conservation? I'm not sure that I understood the question, well, Mr. Chairman. I mean, I think I agree with you. Obviously, price sure. enters into right. the judgments that, that would be made in connection with uh, conservation, exploration, and reworking uh, of wells. Also, secondary and tertiary recovery, right. new and novel devices to enhance or to maintain production from a well. Your comments indicated to me that you're concerned that this particular time that the, that the incentives do not exist at appropriate levels to encourage all of these things, to keep stripper wells, low production wells, and that sort of thing online, to encourage their reworking. Am I correct in, in, in the fact that uh, I believe you have some apprehension expressed in your comments yes, on that sir. matter? Yes, sir. I am what? concerned, and I think that what we have, the President has four uh, initiatives up on the Hill this year for enhanced oil recovery and the like uh, that uh, haven't been all that uh, well received. I think that we're not getting anywhere with those particular initiatives, and I think one of the things this energy strategy will do will maybe uh, focus on that a little bit more, modify. Perhaps we're not even right. Uh, maybe those aren't the best things. They, they primarily affect the independents. Uh, the majors have certainly uh, not uh, gone into fight against it, but they're not uh, all that encouraged by them as helping them out particularly. So I think we have in this, this uh, report opportunity here in the fall when we get to the present to lay out these things in more discrete fashion to see what we really know technologically and the kinds of things we should be doing at the federal level to, to, to spark and enhance the very things that you outline. And obviously they, they, there's a cost to that, but hopefully that most of that cost would be borne out in the marketplace and not by the federal government except as we can enhance uh, 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 research work. Well, it's very clear with the constant decline in U.S. production and with the fact that stripper wells and low production wells are constantly being taken off of production, plugging of wells of that kind and so forth, that, that uh, <coughs> we are not keeping that kind of resource as a functioning part of our energy base, isn't no, it? No, sir. It's very worrisome. As you know, the rig counts are down, the seismic uh, studies are down on oil. Uh, they're moving, migrating more towards uh, towards uh, the gas recovery, and uh, so I think we have a lot of work to do in this area. The the, the little two to ten barrel a day uh, well out there, which is very important to the nation as a whole, uh, we ought to worry a lot about that and not let it uh, decline. So I think we'll be looking at that in the energy strategy to see if there are new incentives or new approaches uh, that may uh, uh, may permit us to keep those online until such time as we prove things like horizontal drilling technologies and see what that may lead to in some of those old fields. Now, Mr. Secretary, let's, let's go to imports of product. There's substantial import of product now, is there not, to replace uh, refinery capacity this country is not, is not bringing online? Or yes, it's substantial, it Mr. Chairman. I don't have the figures. Maybe Ms. Stunts. Maybe, maybe you'd want to submit that for the record, or Ms. Stunts, maybe you want to give us a comment on it. We'll submit it for the record, Mr. Chairman. But it is substantial? Yes, sir, it is. The impact of that on the United States is what? 
obviously it's not good, but what does it, what as a practical matter, what does it do? It means that that we are not necessarily assured of product in the quantity and quality that we might happen to want to meet domestic needs because a foreign, re foreign refiner does not constitute his refinery so that he can produce, let's say, reformulated gasoline, or he does not produce it so that it, it uh, has the appropriate level of aromatics and benzenes and things of that kind. We have a significant problem in terms of having on, on hand both the required supply of gasoline of appropriate quality, but also the problem of having on hand gasoline which meets our environmental demands. Isn't that right? I agree with all that. It also is an export of jobs, which is also very worrisome to a nation that uh, developed all the technology. It's, a, it's the same kind of a problem we're facing in so many areas. It's just one of the many areas of technologies where we have allowed them to go offshore and, and be sold back to us at, uh, uh, with a negative impact on, uh, on the import uh, uh, economics. Do you want to give us some comment as to the extent and the character and the quality of this particular problem? I think I better provide that, that for the record, Mr. Chairman. Be, I just don't have the data to, uh, to, to give you my, my own personal uh, feel. I, th I think it's serious. We've got to worry a lot about it for the very reasons you raise and for the reason I raise. It's just another loss of American jobs in an area that uh, should be ours. In addition to other things else, it is, however, an environmental problem. Now, we have a problem with regard to low-level nuclear waste. A lot of states are now grappling with the problem of uh, siting of low-level nuclear waste storage sites. Um, I, I speak with some interest in this because mm -hmm. the governor of our state under the recently passed legislation has uh, indicated through the commission which he has appointed the possibility of one being cited in my district. Um, would you, could you tell us uh, what, what are your thoughts with regard to the need for the, uh, the, the need for uh, the number of waste sites that are indicated in the, in the compacts, uh, whether or not these waste sites could be reduced, uh, whether there are steps which could be taken to reduce the volume of such wastes, uh, and whether or not DOE can do anything to reduce the uh, number of sites and to assist the multi-state compacts to reduce the number of sites. Well, let me take them in reverse order, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one, as you know, uh, this is an area that is not a primary DOE responsibility. This, is, this has been given to, by the Congress to the state. The, the states are uh, regulating and uh, setting up the very consortia and so forth for low-level waste. States wanted it and they got it. And they got it. And uh, we commend them for that. We don't need another uh, burden on uh, radioactive waste uh, uh, solution. We, we, we have enough of those problems now. Uh, but at any rate, we do provide the state with technical assistance teams. Anytime they request it, we're involved with them. We know what the rules are. We can help them establish the various, um, uh, the various uh, uh, selected consortia sites. So we're providing that assistance now. We'll continue to provide that. We've been asked by uh, one, one group in a set of letters to us, uh, won't you please take over the uh, DOE, get, get DOE to take over the responsibility for low-level radioactive waste, and we're not going to accept that unless we're ordered to do it. And uh, so I hope that that's not going to be the outcome of the state's confusion because we can't help them any more than they're helping themselves. And some of them are doing an excellent job, by the way, Mr. Chairman, I think, trying to come to grips realistically with this issue uh, where one particular state accepts a site uh, with, a, with a total of five contributors to that site. And uh, while that's a thorny issue, I think it's being, uh, in, in some cases, uh, resolved with uh, great professionalism and a, a recognition that we're all going to have to share some of these burdens, because particularly in the area of medical waste. That's a significant contributor to low-level radioactive waste. And uh, we've just gone through the uh, very disturbing situation on the Clean Air Bill in the House on radionuclides, I mean, I'm sorry, in the Senate on radionuclides provision. I uh, had the provision initially in there that was uh, fortunately cleaned up at the 11th hour by the Senate, and it continued. Uh, we would have had a very serious problem. We would have essentially close down uh, radioactive therapy in our hospitals nationally. So I think I would encourage you, particularly because you're sensitive to these areas and knowledgeable about them, that you would watch that as it moves through the House and that we don't have something silly in there that would make a person with iodine 131 to eliminate a thyroid problem wandering around as a felon uh, that would have to be picked up and thrown into some sort of a lead shield. Uh, but rather that, that this is a perfectly legitimate thing and the dose rates are acceptable 
uh, established uh, internationally and nationally, and we need not change that whole process now and uh, all of a sudden finds ourselves looking at one issue that may be a state's right issue on setting levels for radioactivity, and yet uh, we, we throw out, again, the baby with the bathwater here. And I can assure you that the hospitals in the country uh, wound up to high gear on that particular issue once they realized it was part of the Clean Air Act, that it slipped in, as you might say, way in the background and never in debate in any of the early Senate debates. It just popped up on the floor. And I think those are the kinds of things we have to worry a lot about, or there won't be any future for nuclear power, uh, even in the most rational sense. Mr. Secretary, what about the possibility of reducing the number of these sites? Is that a matter in which your agency can be of assistance, or is that a matter which lies solely within the province of the states under existing law? I think it, re it remains with the states, Mr. Chairman. Again, however, we are pleased to provide our comments to the state when asked and with teams that we'll send out to uh, do anything they, th they feel uh, would optimize their chances for success of establishing a low-level uh, radioactive waste site. Uh, to that extent, we're willing to do it. If you would like me to uh, provide you some more detail on this whole uh, low-level radioactive waste perspectives as we see it now, I I'd be pleased to do that for the record. I think that would be useful, Mr. Secretary. I note that there are some 17 sites suggested. Yes. My question is, do we need 17 given the volume of waste that's being generated, or is, is, is again, that a matter that uh, you prefer to give an, an answer to for that? Let me have a, a separate look at that. I'm not up to speed on the uh, answer to that question. I'll send it in to the record. Um, Mr. Secretary, as you know, for a long time I've been concerned with the Energy Information Agency with its independence. You do not now have a head for that agency, is that correct? He's announced his resignation, Mr. Uh, Merklin has announced his resignation, but he has not left yet. We, have, we do have a, a candidate uh, that we have uh, worked with the White House on. We hope to have his name come over here very shortly, a highly qualified individual to take over that. And that we've got some changes that we want to make in our approach uh, in uh, EIA that will be much more closely linked with policy and the national energy strategy issues. Uh, for example, uh, we had a lot of lessons learned out of the Northeast situation. Uh, we are not on top of uh, propane inventories, for example. In fact, after the 81 law in which we were no longer involved in, in any kind of price allocations for energy, uh, we lost all of the ability to go get data in certain areas. And uh, that, we've got to go get so? it again. You, you, wh where are you foreclosed from data that, of which you had need? Wasn't there authority? It, they voluntarily decided to stop collecting information. What's that? But what happened here, Mr. Chairman, is, uh, is classic. Uh, when, when you lose the uh, accountability and responsibility for a thing like that, what happens is then you come back and say, but I want to keep the data anyway in the information agency. Uh, that costs so many dollars. Uh, you try to clear that through a system that says, you aren't in the business anymore. You don't get the dollars. You're talking, so, about, you're talking about then OMB doing this. Is that what you're Well, saying? let me say uh, that it appears to be that way, uh, Mr. Chairman. We don't need statutory authority. We need the, uh, uh, the backbone uh, to... Uh, uh, put in us uh, to go fight for the dollars to get this data, and I think the crisis in the Northeast will give us that, and the 92 budget will reflect some is, additional is, is work it, we have to do to know what the, uh, what the heating oil levels are, what the propane levels are, exactly where they sit, and uh, it will be uh, 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 appropriate to have, we're not having semi-annual meetings with the leadership out there in industry to talk about these things and to lay upon the board. Uh, the situation that we might see in the Northeast, say, in the fall, that says, look, you guys, here's where you were last year, here's where your inventories are now as from our data, and uh, here we think uh, you better be doing something about it, even though we recognize you've got to turn over these, uh, this uh, heating oil over a period of time. Uh, we don't want to get in that situation again and, uh, and have to use, uh, uh, to use the jo Smith, uh, uh, Jones Act to, uh, to uh, rededicate ships uh, headed offshore with uh, propane to bring back into your part of the region. You need to build up those supplies now to levels that would have gotten you out of trouble last year. Th those are the kind of things we can do. We can, we can uh, cajole and we can talk and we can work with and we can hold seminars and that's our plan. But to get our Energy Information Act together on the baseline of data we need, and that's going to have to start from scratch. We do not have that today on propane in the Northeast, for example. And we're going to have to rebuild it. 
It you, disappeared, Mr. Chairman. You have reinforced a concern which I've had for a long time, which I shall pursue in my next round of questions. Uh, gentleman from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, conservation is uh, often touted, and I think with good reason, is, uh, is the answer to some of our problems. But then some of the proposals, if you don't examine them in depth, um, can produce unintended uh, effects. Um, I know, for example, uh, we are marking up um, RICRA reauthorization and, and another subcommittee of this committee. One of the proposals has to do with uh, the so-called tax on virgin materials to force um, recycling. And that may be a worthwhile objective in some cases, but take the case of paper, for example. <coughs> Um, where a tax might be placed on, um, on virgin paper as an alternative to uh, recycled paper. And yet, if you, if you examine the nature of the U.S. communications industry, packaging industry, this isn't to say that recycling doesn't have a place, but what it did was to spawn the reforestation of large sections of the United States in the post-World War II period, which had an enormous environmental benefit. It took marginal cropland out of production that was producing siltation, uh, uh, chemical runoff from uh, heavy um, fertilization of marginal agriculture. Uh, it, it, it replaced uh, marginal farmland with trees, uh, which has had a, a, a tremendous environmental benefit. No one uh, wants to go back and re-examine that when they make suggestions with respect to uh, 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 so a virgin materials tax, for example. Um, as we get into some of these things, do you consider this study and, and, and what it may undertake with respect to conservation taking a look at, at, at what may be unintended effects of uh, a proposed solution such as that? Yes, sir, we will, because I think it's very important that we, uh, we surround uh, that issue sufficiently to make the kind of judgments <laughs> that you're implying we should make. Uh, in, the, in one of the issues that we had hoped to get out with the first uh, interim report was uh, a challenge to meet environmental challenges through pollution prevention and waste minimization. <coughs> and, and that involves the recycling issue, incentives for this, and so forth. So that will be part of the energy strategy. Uh, today, for example, if there are 54 million uh, acres of unused land not in the reserve that uh, are owned by in, 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 uh, in Interior, and uh, those uh, could easily be used in the, within the Department of Agriculture for generating hybrid poplars, uh, for example, for expanded uh, uh, and new sources of energy out of agriculture that we hadn't, uh, we hadn't really focused on in the Department of Energy at all. So we're work very work working very closely now with agriculture to see what can be done in the way of agriculture's contribution to energy, which is probably even more powerful than uh, taking existing hydro uh, uh, power plants and uh, repowering some of them or enhancing on existing dams and so forth. So th there may be a lot there. Uh, incentives to achieve those uh, objectives are going to have to be addressed, see what, what we need to do. And certainly uh, the whole area of biobass is, uh, is at, the, at the focal point of our attention as we go into alternative energy sources, particularly for the near term, for this decade. And we'll have to find uh, what that's going to cost, and can we uh, incentivize those things for periods of time? Does it make sense in the overall scheme of things? So uh, clearly uh, uh, the, uh, the forestation issue uh, is important, uh, and the benefits of recycling are very important. And we ought to, uh, we ought to, we ought to provide you uh, with some uh, options in there to deal with that, and that's what we intend to do. Conservation, in, uh, in most cases, implies a, uh, a standard of uh, <coughs> or change in personal behavior, does it not? Yes, did sir. You, did I understand you to say that um, the evidence in, uh, that you gathered to date indicated uh, a strong support of the idea of conservation, but largely it was based upon someone else conserving something rather than... Uh, Personal commitment. I'm sad to say that, uh, Mr. Millen, but I, uh, Mr. Wilson, but I think, uh, uh, Mr. Millen, but I think it, I think it, uh, uh, that's exactly right. Uh, now, whether we get something on the table that people are willing to say yes, we're willing to go through the recycling burden at our home. 
we think it's a good idea, uh, then we have to see that uh, the various entities that handle that do an efficient job. And we have to provide some sort, I think, of, um, of review uh, that says if we're going to continue this, if we're going to have a program like this, then we want to see some aggressive actions taken locally to make sure that that kind of thing minimizes the impact on a household. We've seen recent uh, indications here that uh, paper is stacking up somewhere. Well, that rots away, and so we don't really recycle it. It becomes another burden for us. So if we're going to have this recycling issue, then we have to build the recycling facilities, and uh, we should, people should be getting credit for that, and I believe that goes into the integrated resource planning concept. Uh, if you're going to have an integrated resource plan, then that means we ought to be interested in waste minimization at the very front end of our process, and that includes recycling and the other things. So hopefully the encouragement in the energy strategy will be states that have integrated resource incentives uh, as long as they follow certain practices. And I think this is clearly one of them. Is it, is it fair to say that real source reduction, if you're going to pursue a market-oriented approach to um, solving the problem, really involves building into the cost of any product that we consume the cost of its disposition? Well, I think that there, there, there is an area where, uh, where I think technology uh, can help us a lot. And I don't think we have uh, organized ourselves in this country on the technologies uh, to minimize the downstream remediation that's otherwise necessary. I think it's a big problem. And we're setting up now in our national laboratories uh, the upfront design, whether it's nuclear power plants is along the lines I mentioned with actinide waste uh, limit, uh, limitations, or whether it's uh, recycling uh, for integrated uh, resource planning, or whether it's uh, things like uh, the new model of gas turbines. Uh, the new gas turbines are, are very efficient, uh, much more so than in the past, and generate far fewer uh, uh, gas emissions, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so we hope that we can provide the incentives to move in all of these directions uh, that will meet the general principles of trying to achieve our economic objectives, but not to shooting ourselves in the environmental foot in the process. And we think we can do that. And we, we think we can find a, 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 a narrow a line in that labyrinth of issues that has to be faced. And one final question. Um, we've got a major national resource, I think, in, in laboratories that, uh, that, that largely are under the direction of your department, uh, Lawrence Livermore, Los Alamos, uh, and others, which have uh, performed uh, an enormously important uh, role in um, national security, um, stable, more stable world in which we live today and, and have the room to exercise options that haven't been available to us. If in fact, uh, and it remains to be seen the degree to which it does occur, but if in fact we have a lesser commitment with respect to the utilization of these resources for uh, national security purposes, do you foresee uh, these resources being utilized in, in dealing with the admittedly complex technological questions that we're groping with here today? Absolutely. In fact, uh, they've already been tasked and they're in the middle of the technology review, the very basic research into the five-year plan for a toxic uh, waste uh, 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 cleanup in the country. Uh, so they are being tasked to come into fields that uh, they've been given only light treatment in the past. Also, I'm bringing uh, together uh, in another week uh, the first meeting of the newly established uh, Secretary of Energy Advisory Board with some of the top talent in the world coming together to help me. 29 people, three Nobel laureates, um, presidents of universities, uh, presidents of foundations have been all in, the, in all of these areas to help me on the longer range plan. And the first order of business is I want to have them review for me over the next year the future role of the national laboratories, both defense, you mentioned defense laboratories, but we've also got a non-defense laboratory. Very, very important to the nation as a whole. 23,000 scientists, 50,000 technicians out there, and they have to be involved in these issues. In the first place, many of their products generate the waste that we're having now to clean up. So therefore, they have a legitimate role to play in this upfront design that I mentioned called waste minimization, 
as well as the waste cleanup for sins of the past lives. And so these are they're going to be new challenges for them. And the Energy Advisory Board, uh, Secretary of Energy Advisory Board, will be tasked to come back to me and say, how do we retain this incredibly important national resource of human minds to help us so that we keep them level loaded and let program oscillate in and out, but let's, let's, let's manage those programs so these labs can continue to devote their attention to things like technology transfer, for example. Very important to transfer to our own industry to give us the economic underpinning. Waste management. They have to get involved with that. Not only would it be good for the DOE complex, but more importantly, all federal complexes and the civilian sector as well, who don't know how to clean these things up either. Uh, it is a very big problem. The whole waste program in the United States, in my opinion, uh, is at a critical state. And we have to come to grips with finding the answers to some of these things, whether it's solid waste, toxic waste, or radioactive. It's the biggest growth industry that I foresee in the next uh, decade. And uh, we need the kids uh, trained and educated to come and help out. And it seems to me this is an area where environmental activists could play a very strong role, uh, encouraging their youngsters to come into these fields where we need this kind of help. But the national laboratories are being tasked, have been tasked, and will continue to play a major role now in the future cleanup. And we're establishing, uh, we're establishing laboratories just to do this alone and to coordinate this up in the northwest region. We'll have an entire laboratory uh, uh, dedicated to national waste uh, management. So this, this, is, uh, this is what we're doing in that area. That's very encouraging. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Sure, thanks, the gentleman. Mr. Secretary, your comments with regard to the new head of EIA and your ability to gather the information that are needed are a matter of rather special concern to me. As you'll recall, Mr. Moss, myself, and my good friend Mr. Brown of Ohio put that in the original DOE authorization bill with the eye that that was going to provide you with the necessary information on a continuing, continuing and impartial basis as we became aware as we looked at the last energy crisis that one of the reasons we'd been unable to prepare for or to respond properly to the last energy crisis was the inavailability either of reliable data or an, or an agency inside DOE to gather, to collate, and to put in usable form the information was necessary to advise the president and the head of DOE as to the status of oil supplies and energy supplies generally, but also very specifically insofar as they existed with regard to the United States. I find myself very troubled that you do not have a new head to EIA uh, available to take over and commence the running of that agency. And I find myself equally troubled to find that you are having ability in procuring the information on matters as important as propane, the status of energy affairs in, uh, in the nation, uh, so that you can have a necessary and proper response plan or advise the president or the other agencies of government, including the Congress, as what it is we ought to do as a matter of national policy on matters of this kind. Well, I agree with you, Mr. Chairman. My, my, I was as, you know, as disappointed as others were when it came down to an emergency that we had on the 23rd of December when we brought in the various people from industry, some 70 people, to talk about what was going on and what we might do to uh, mitigate the uh, situation there and the prospectus uh, to find out we simply did not know what the situation was, particularly with propane. We, we had a good handle, I think, uh, on, uh, on uh, what the situation was with uh, uh, heating oil, uh, but we weren't ringing the bell. We weren't raising the issue in a timely fashion, say, before the winter season came in, to bring these people in and really debate these things, saying, here's where we see they are. Is this cr true? And if so, uh, what, is your, what are your plans to uh, bring in additional commodities? What are the states doing on this? Uh, I believe the states share a great deal of uh, responsibility here as well. Uh, we don't have the authority uh, anymore to control these things, nor, and nor do I think we should have it. But I do think we can be a lot more aggressive in, in uh, bringing these entities together and looking at commodities that we normally have not uh, been active in. And I think that this is a, uh, we expose an Achilles heel of our, of our system over there by focusing too much on all the other normal energy uh, sources and, uh, and this uh, more or less local issue uh, was, not, uh, was not, in our, uh, not in our data bank. Uh, I, this is a thing we're going to have to correct it.
I would like to forward report as to what it is you're, you're doing about these two matters, Mr. Secretary, and when we can anticipate that, there's, that these matters are cured. I do want you to understand that, that the appropriation bill that you're, you're looking at is going to contain line item language in this if I have any say on the matter. So that you Just let me, uh, and, I'll, and I'll provide a more detailed answer for the record. I would like to <coughs> let you know that we have done a, a lot since that event uh, last fall. Uh, we're doing the, um, uh, a, a complete price analysis, as you know. We, we're responding to your query on that, and by 1 June, we will know exactly where we stand on, the, on uh, any, uh, any price gouging that might have been there from the, uh, from the first calendar quarter uh, uh, profit report. So we'll, we'll have that back to you. But that's more or less, uh, that's just one of the action items. Here's another one. We found out that we could not expeditiously uh, get very, very uh, variances from the Jones Act requirements. We, we didn't have a streamlined system to move it through the intergovernment agency. It was all there, but it was a laborious process. And we found ships of uh, liquid natural gas, or propane rather, getting out beyond reach before we could uh, 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 move them uh, into the Northeast. Uh, we were subsequently uh, able to get uh, uh, two in. Uh, one a significant contribution, one other one not so significant, but at least we got the process working, and we're working out an MOU now with Customs Service and Maritime Administration to ensure we don't have any internal bottlenecks and we can move more expeditiously in the future to grab a hold of those when we need to. Uh, we're doing the analysis now uh, that we're undertaking uh, to address federal, uh, state, uh, industry, consumer options for dealing with these crises in the future. Uh, we don't have up to date, an up-to-date analysis of this, and that's part of the process of getting our feet on the ground on this particular issue. And we're working with FERC to ensure that uh, anything we need to do there in liaison is, uh, is, uh, is done now in anticipation of, of possible recurrence of this in the future. We've set up these semi-annual meetings. I mentioned that earlier. Our first one is this week, where we bring business and industry in here to talk about uh, where they stand on, on, on a, a variety of these uh, energy commodities. Uh, that, uh, that uh, we feel that uh, need attention, and uh, that will be helpful. We're also some set setting up some regional state seminars on this, so hopefully these will be held in anticipation of things like winter or even in summer as well, uh, and can uh, begin to take a, uh, a much more aggressive, uh, you might say coordinating role. Uh, even though we, we, we can't direct anything, I think we can expose a lot of things. Uh, we will uh, make, be more aggressive in our af after action reports. And uh, with the data in here, then we can be much more responsive, I think, to you and others who are trying to get answers out of us. And it seems to be very sluggish, like you're pulling I our eye teeth out to, to, get, to get some answers. We don't have ready answers in some cases because we don't have the, the data that we should have. And then the, just a continuing dialogue that we're going to have. But we, we do have, I think, an aggressive after action plan and I would like to submit to, to you, for the record, a more detailed rundown of exactly what we are doing. It would be appreciated, Mr. Secretary. I do want you to understand that it will, it's the expectation of this committee, in particular its chairman, that, that you will have the necessary information available so that if crisis arrives, we will know what the facts are and can craft appropriate national response to these matters. And I don't sense that that's going on down there at this particular time. Mr. Secretary, um, let us go now to the question of, uh, of, of an oil shutoff. Uh, what, what authorities do you have to respond to a shutoff of oil or a major crisis in terms of supply, either with regard to petroleum or petroleum product because of some events that would happen, let's say, in the Persian Gulf or somewhere else? Do you have any authorities at yes, all? Yes, we have authority under declared national emergency in that regard under the provisions of the, of the uh, the congressional uh, legislation in this what regard. Would that, what would that authority extend to, Mr. Secretary? It would allow us to uh, pump down the Strategic Petroleum Reserve into the main pipeline system to refineries and to get out. And we have a bidding system. We exercise at that. We know how to do it. Uh, I've been down to uh, several of the facilities to see the oil really move. 100,000 barrels were moved the day I was there. We know how to do that. That would be uh, your sole authority, would be to be my move sole oil. authority under those very uh, extreme conditions, and that, that does not include domestic problems such as we might have in the Port of Valdez. And this, this came to my attention, obviously, last year when we had the situation arise that what would have happened had that ship uh, gone aground maybe across the entrance channel and closed the port for 30 days or 60 days. It had a severe 
uh, disruption in the West Coast, availability of uh, those products to go to their refineries. We could have solved it. The, the supply is there internationally. There's no question about that. And we could have moved some things, but at some expense, uh, considerable expense. So we began to look then for a per perhaps uh, some recommended changes to the law that under certain circumstances we might recommend to the President uh, and uh, with a congressional approval of such a procedure, uh, times when we think it's in the best interest of the country to, uh, to build down in the strategic control, at least for a period of time for sta price stabilization. And uh, so we're trying to define that now and, uh, and see if uh, th we've run some seminars on this, some war games, if you will, on the kinds of things that could be uh, impose severe limitations internally from disruption of our own internal supply, such as coming out of Alaska. And I think that might, uh, uh, we need your help on that as we uh, define exactly how that process might work. And obviously we have a limitation on the number of cycles we can impose on the salt gnome. So we don't want to exceed that. We, it cannot be cavalierly done every time we have a little problem use the strategic petroleum reserve. I don't mean that. But if we had a se severe reduction, suppose we had a major fire in the port of Valdez around the refinery and had a 90-day outage or something like that, we would, uh, that would be uh, grounds for considering uh, uh, emergency use in the context of a revised law rather than the existing law, which would preclude us from doing that without congressional, uh, without some alteration of the current law. Secretary, do you have the capacity to deliver oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to the uh, pipelines and then through the pipelines to refiners? Are there any limitations of which you're aware in connection with those matters? We can deliver to the pipelines. I, I, I'm not sure I can answer your question about limitations. I believe there like probably are some limitations there, and, uh, and maybe those, uh, and maybe I could provide those to you uh, in response to the rec for the record. Mr. Secretary, if you don't mind, I have some very dark suspicions that you do not have the capacity to deliver that uh, the crude in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve reservoirs to the refineries which would have need of it. I even have doubt that you have both the capacity to move it through pipeline, but also that you have the refinery capacity that's necessary to process the particular kind of crude and then to deliver it to market in, in the appropriate fashion and time. I'm going to ask Mr. Wu to work with Ms. Stunts and, and your other people so that we can get some answers to that for insertion in the record, because I, that if, if we spent the billions of dollars we have to generate the ownership of massive amounts of oil and then don't have the ability to get it to market. There can be some awful red faces around this time. If I couldn't agree time. more. I, I, have, uh, I am not aware that we have reached that uh, <coughs> point or we're, are at that point, Mr. Chairman, so I would like to work with, uh, with your that staff on that and, and can come to grips with it because certainly we, I would agree with you that that's the situation. We, it's not tolerable. Both with regard to deliverability from the reserve, deliverability into the pipeline system, deliverability through the pipeline system, deliver, and then the ability to uh, reproduce, or rather to refine the amount of, of oil that we would get there because if we had a shutoff of crude, we would of course also have a shutoff of, uh, of uh, product too because others, other countries would commence looking to their own well-being and there wouldn't be the surplus of refined product which essentially comes to this country through the spot market. I so think I though, Mr. Chairman, in, in all fairness, we do have out there in the private sector uh, more than we have in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve on reserve now that the, that the various uh, uh, refinery companies have access to. I think what this would do is in that interim period uh, give some indication that they would have a continuing availability even though it may not uh, have the same uh, pipeline access to their refineries that their existing uh, resources have. I do think we, we can get it there. Uh, and I think that the, the very fact that we would allow that oil to flow into cap line pipe and, and, um, and move into refineries is probably uh, according to all our analysis, a saving, uh, have a saving influence on, on price escalation during the it, uh, interim period. Admittedly, more tough to get there, but I, I think it can be shown that we can get there with it. But we, uh, we'll work with your staff on that. I tend to be a very trusting fellow, but I also like to cut the cards on, on these kinds of matters, Mr. Secretary. Um, is it your belief that we should continue to have a strategic petroleum reserve? Uh, yes, sir. I do think so. I, 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 have a, uh, I have a serious question whether it should go above 750 million barrels, however. Uh, I believe that the, 
the continuing thrust towards building it larger and larger is probably uh, not the best way to use those dollars, which, are, as you know, are very expensive. We're talking 10 to 15 billion dollars initially uh, to, to take it up to those higher levels. The question is, is that the best use of those resources? Uh, should we be providing ourselves with uh, an oil linus blanket to that extent, or should we put those things into other alternatives uh, that would, uh, would cut down the need to draw against that account uh, by other sources of energy? And I, I believe that the latter has merit. And so I, I think the 750 is probably about the right level, and I think it should be there at least for the foreseeable future. Do we have the refinery capacity necessary to refine that uh, level of uh, reserve in, in the appropriate time and fashion and amount? At the current uh, drawdown levels of about two and a half million dollars a, a day, the answer is yes, and we're going, as you know, to four and a half million uh, barrels a day uh, potential within the next couple of years. And uh, I'll have to get the answer to the record. I, I, I believe the answer is yes, but you obviously have reservations about that, so I then am worried about it and we'll... Doubts we'll would be the better word, Mr. Secretary. Doubts about it. Mr. Secretary, um, do we need a regional reserve? There have been a lot of demands for regional reserves in places like New England, Hawaii, and so forth. Well, I, I, I tried to address that earlier, Mr. Chairman, by saying that I think it's a mistake for the American taxpayer across this nation to pay for a regional petroleum reserve in the northeast of the United States when they have made certain decisions on refineries and other things that would impose this additional tax burden on the nation. I don't understand that. Now, Hawaii is a different story. Hawaii is a non-contiguous state. They don't have a, a gas or oil pipeline to them except by ship. Uh, they were very worried about the Exxon Valdez spill and how it, uh, it uh, nearly brought them to their oil knees. But by the same token, during our hearings in Hawaii on the National Energy Strategy, I made it pretty clear, and I have in all my dis subsequent discussions with them, that until they demonstrate that they have some kind of integrated resource planning and energy that deals with their considerable capability in renewables, their, perhaps their ability to cut down on the transportation demands against the oil account. I'm not sure what they can do with aviation fuels, but uh, until they can look at this thing in, in terms of conservation, that there's not going to be that much interest in putting out uh, another big set of tanks out there at federal expense uh, to continue uh, to feed uh, what appears to be a fairly voracious appetite for oil, perhaps beyond that which is reasonable and their alternatives. And it seems to me that uh, that has not gone over all that poorly out there. Uh, they realize, and they're in the process of building such a Hawaii energy strategy along these lines, I hope. And then we'll see whether you really need that or whether it does that much good. We believe that we can get the oil there if necessary uh, by other means and that we, we, we don't see that as the best investment for billions of dollars where they might be able to find other alternatives. And they have some very unique uh, potential sources of energy there, as you know, uh, from, uh, from wind, from the deep, deep ocean coal called OTEC, uh, from the geothermal, which is a problem for them, and I recognize they're dealing with that, but modern technologies could bring not only geothermal power to uh, the big island of Hawaii and Maui, but could also be uh, taken over in cables that's been proven to go under the, under the channels between uh, Hawaii and Oahu. So these are the things they have to look at and decide whether that's where they want to put their investment or do they want to build tanks uh, over on the, on the western shore. Now, uh, Mr. Secretary, you have no other standby authority for energy in the event of a shutoff, is that correct? No authority to allocate or control prices whatsoever? Uh, speaking of oil, no, sir, we do not. None. Do you have any on any other propane, butane? We do not. We do have some authority, and, and Ms. Stunts can elaborate on uh, electrical, uh, transmission of electrical energy. That's all? So that's all we have. And if you had major oil shut off, that wouldn't, that wouldn't do much to resolve your problem? No, except that I think that I, under those circumstances, I would, uh, if we didn't meet the exact provisions of the law on SPRO, that we would review the bidding on that to determine whether or not it was important for us to seek congressional support uh, from the President to perhaps uh, draw down SPRO for a period of time if we felt that was in the best interest of price stabilization. But obviously, we can't go very long, somewhere around 80 days. We have 500 and 
80 million barrels now in the, in the reserve. Now, in the event of a shutdown, what are our commitments through international agreements with other nations? For example, NATO, Israel, and other countries. What commitments do we have to The commitments we have through the international network is actually that we become an importer. Beg pardon? We become an importer is the net way it works out under, under a, a world stoppage of oil flow. In other words, the nations now have the equivalent of strategic petroleum reserves in varying degrees uh, in, the, in the consortium of nations involved. Uh, and so we have commitments, though, to provide uh, the needed petroleum supplies to other countries in, in the event of a, of a major shutoff internationally. It depends on the impact, but if it's a worldwide uh, shutoff, such as we might have in, the, in a Persian Gulf scenario of some kind, uh, then I think uh, clearly uh, the nations are going to be extremely concerned about exporting any oil. But the net flow, actually, by the formulas and things, would come to the United States. Would that happen? I doubt it. Uh, I mean, we're, they're all going to be extremely concerned uh, where they have a much higher percentage dependence on Middle East oil, for example, than we do uh, for any kind of a situation like that. But we're all hooked up together. We've tested our international communication network. We know how to do it. We know how to talk to each other. We know what the sizes of the reserves are. And we, we can coordinate the actions. Uh, but I don't think we could rely or should rely, this nation, on, uh, on our NATO allies helping us in a crisis of that magnitude uh, to export oil to the United States. Well, I think that's, that's probably almost a certainty. And it becomes more so as Britain's North Sea fields begin to age and their production commences a decline, which I gather is about to start. Is that right? I think that's, I think that's correct, Mr. Chairman, yes. Um, I'm going to request that Mr. Wu work with Ms. Dunst to try and gather the information that be pleased to do that, would Mr. be responsive to the concerns of the committee with regard to uh, commitments. Uh, I've, I've always found that the administration, at least the State Department, is quite quick to make agreements with other countries to provide them with oil in the event of a, of, of a shutoff, but it's not equally um, vigorous in communicating with you or advising the Congress. As a matter of fact, there appears to be a certain reticence on the part of the administration in informing us of the character of the commitments, and we're always told that we should be comfortable up here. And we're all, I'm usually comfortable as long as the supply keeps coming in, but uh, I always remember what happened in the 70s. And, and uh, Admiral, I just, I just tell you that when that occurred, the Congress stayed up late at night writing legislation. Uh, and we wrote it till 2 and 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning until we were done writing it. I won't tell you it was very good, but there was nobody in the White House and nobody anywhere else that was going to stand in the way of that legislation. Uh, and I've tried to warn people downtown that this is a genuine concern that you should feel. Uh, it may be the administration is going to rely on free market, but don't bet that the American people are going to. And don't bet that you're going to be safe as you drive to work or that the president is going to be safe as he drives to work, because there's going to be a lot of people going to be walking, and they're going to be looking for rocks to throw at people that are driving to work while they can't, especially because they've relied on the free market as opposed to relying on the, on the uh, assurances that the government is going to see to it that there is supply and that there is fair treatment in those times. Well, I think we have, uh, we discussed this at the Inter International Energy Agency meetings. Uh, I think the nations have been very forthcoming about it. I think they're willing to share burdens. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, clearly the other nations have been serious about increasing their stocks and their reserves, and, uh, and I believe we have a very good coordinating uh, arrangement. And at this point in time, I don't see anything in any of the uh, in the emergency actions that would indicate that the United States, under those extreme circumstances, would become a net exporter of the oil. I hope you'll pardon me if I'm not as comfortable on that as you are, Mr. No, Secretary. There are all special exceptions, Mr. Chairman, as you know. I was, I was here the last time we had this fuss. Um, Mr. Secretary, can you tell me how you're coming on the efficiency standards uh, with regard to appliances, furnaces, refrigerators, toasters, television sets, matters of that sort? I think we're Perhaps. doing quite well, Mr. Chairman. We, as you know, we've come up with uh, one rulemaking, which I think has uh, been accepted. Uh, nationally for significant uh, improvement in efficiency standards for refrigerators, and we do have more issues coming up. Uh, I'd like to have Ms. Stuntz uh, address those perhaps in, in some more detail than I can at this Could point. Could we have Mr. Wu and Ms. Stuntz work together to get Absolutely. some insertion in the yes, record? Sir. I think that would be useful. I'm very anxious to know of the dates when we can anticipate those to be uh, in place with regard to the different categories of appliances. 
Are you still confronting opposition from the Office of Management and Budget with regard to completion of those particular No, sir, standards? we're not. I think there we have a, a very good uh, working relationship now. I think it's quite new in the Department to have a, a different relationship with Office of Management and Budget. Uh, frankly, I think they've been extremely helpful. Mr. Grady over there, who is our contact point, has been very responsive to the Department. We have we simply don't have those kinds of issues. Also, we've got a president who's been very supportive of the action I've taken to, uh, to face a lot of these issues that uh, have been put on the shelf for a long time. So I do believe we have a new relationship there. And right now, uh, I do not have a complaint with Office of Management and Budget. Uh, in the past, uh, there obviously have been some problems. The track record is, is filled with uh, opposition to a variety of things. I do not have that today. Well, the Congress literally had to pass legislation commanding you to proceed to do this in the teeth of the opposition of, of the administration. I don't mean you, but I mean your predecessor in office, simply because the, the, the belief was it should be a free market. And the states then set about writing standards <coughs> of this kind. And, and the, Congress, the Congress found itself confronted with a situation where manufacturers were going to have to manufacture appliances to meet 50 different uh, environmental and uh, energy conservation standards, and, and there's no way that, in, that, a, that an assembly line can be run by any kind of intelligent businessman to accomplish that crazy goal. Well, I agree with you, Mr. Chairman, but I do think that our first initiative to go out and really go after uh, freezers and refrigerators that gave us a 25 percent uh, efficiency uh, in those uh, was accepted, and I, and I believe that, that shows the validity of the, of the open comment process in uh, working with the Hill up here to uh, go as far as we can without being uh, extreme or putting ourselves in an economic bind. And so I hope that is a template for the things coming downstream, such as furnaces and other, other things that we're now working on. And we'll get with Mr. Wu and uh, get very specific about that, where we stand and what we're doing. Mr. Secretary, what's the status of alternative fuels and clean coal technology inside the Department? What will be the dates for uh, clean coal technology being completed and ready and available for the uh, uh, available for uh, disseminating into industry as a new technology? Let, let me take clean coal technology first, and then I'll ask Ms. Stuntz, who's the uh, leading DOE expert on alternative fuels, to answer the specifics on alternative fuels. Uh, clean coal technology. As you know, we're now in round three. Uh, uh, we, we have five rounds. Uh, they should complete uh, over the next two years, round four this year, round five next year. Um, those technologies involve uh, about uh, over 20 and will eventually involve almost 40 uh, demonstration projects of, uh, of varying types. Uh, and hundreds of millions of dollars. A total of so far of uh, several billion, but going towards uh, six billion. Five billion was the shared goal between federal government and the private sector. But the private sector is contributing more than the federal government now, and probably we will go as high as $6 billion invested in the variety of clean coal technologies uh, that are out there. Uh, some are obviously very promising. Others are not. We have some obstacles. One of the obstacles is a decision called the WEPCO decision. In the clean air package that came up the hill, we said it was not only important that we have it, we needed it right away because it was turning off the private industry to even come in to bid on our clean coal demonstration projects. Uh, several have dropped off the line because of it. One actually pulled uh, their earlier positive response because of it. So we do have some problems in, in managing the clean coal technology along those lines uh, that are environmentally driven. Uh, and we're trying to work now with EPA to get some kind of administrative resolution on the WEPCO decision so we don't penalize uh, plants for coming in and engaging in the repowering techniques and the technologies that we have without being penalized for, uh, for under a new set of laws that would be otherwise imposed when by existing regulatory standards. Pardon me, sir? You mean clean air legislation, Mr. Secretary? It's part of clean air legislation, yes, sir. It is. It is, it is, it is I'd, it, like, I'd like a full report on that, and I'm going to request Mr. Wu to work with Ms. Stunts to see to it that we have it. We believe it's so important, Mr. Chairman, in, in bringing clean coal technologies on uh, not so much for the clean coal technology, which is very pretty well protected in most of the language we see, but it's a discouragement for the coal industry out there to reboiler, to do the modernization things that they would normally do. It's a disincentive because they shift into a new set of burdens on the SO2 and, and NOx generated. And we believe for the long term of the country, it is best 
to allow them to put in the new efficiencies and the new standards uh, so that we don't uh, take our dollars now on older technologies, such as old technology scrubbers or something like that, and use those dollars to solve near-term problems for the long range uh, uh, that's not in the long range interest of the country. Well, we I believe heard. that by the year 2000, we will have sufficient technologies there so that by the year 2005, we will have online uh, the new repower plants that give us the savings in SO2, NOx, and significant efficiencies to reduce the CO2 generation as well. And we believe that the new technologies can reduce the CO2 generation by as much as 20 to 40 percent uh, by the year 2020. If we allow the process to work and let us demonstrate what are the best uh, mixes of uh, preforming the coal through the coal combustion process to the stack gas and then uh, the reburial of any residue that might come out of the cleanup process. I'm going to uh, ask you this at this time, Mr. Secretary. Are you going to have this new clean coal technology online in time to meet the deadlines of the different clean air bills that are floating around this place? The answer is yes. If we take uh, the year 2003, I believe, is the, is the year that Every we year. believe that we, can, we, we will be sufficiently close at that point on the date spec. In fact, you remember that we specifically extended the date a year for all practical purposes to go to the end of, of that particular year rather than the front end of the year. And that, that made a difference to the industry out there. Now they're saying, well, maybe they need a couple more years. And that's possible. I don't know. I don't have the latest information on uh, the difference between 2003 2005 that are being discussed now. I'm going to request Mr. Wu again to work with Ms. Dunst to try and to be try pleased and to do that. the different bills against the different deadlines and the different technologies so we can have an appreciation of, of how those are going to work. One thing I do know, Mr. Chairman, that I hope that we will not use the rounds four and five dollars to clean up a handful of plants. That I, I am very much against and uh, I'm very concerned about that because once that signal is sent out there, I don't see industry getting that excited about uh, repowering uh, their existing plants and going into, uh, going into our modernization program. Yeah, we're going to clean that out. We are, we've got to clean that up. I'd appreciate your comments on that particular point. Mr. Secretary, I believe that would be that would be very useful to you, but I think it would also be very helpful to us to have your your comments on that on that particular matter. Um, and Mr. Wu, with your approval, I will work with Ms. Dunst, and, and we will see to it that that is inserted in the record in the appropriate fashion and time. Now, Mr. Secretary, what is going on with regard to alternative fuels? The committee is continuously concerned with these matters. We had the Synthetic Fuels Corporation, which turned out to be a magnificent scandal, as you'll recall. Uh, and every man of rogue and knave got in there to um, cut a fat hog at the expense of the public. But we still do need these alternative fuels. The, for example, uh, production of uh, synthetic uh, petroleum and petroleum products from some of your oil shales in the western United States and other things. What yes, is, sir, we do. We have a lot going on in that regard. Congress passed a law on alternative fuels that uh, set up uh, a, uh, a council that's been established in the Department of Energy. My deputy is the chair of that council interagency group and working on things that affect federal government, fleets, for example. Uh, Ms. Stunts has been heavily engaged in the Clean Air Bill on alternative fuels, and I'd like her to uh, give a summary of the specifics in that regard because I think she is best equipped to do that. Uh, and it's a very complex issue, as you know. You're, you're one of the leading experts in the country on it. And, and I'd like to have her talk to you because I think it will be more intelligent. I think it would be very useful. I'd been rather more comfortable had she been doing that work than some of the other people would, in terms of leading out the administration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Fortunately, I am not the DOE's leading expert on alternative fuels, but as a result of that work, I have become familiar with those who are. And there are many things going on in the department about that. Let me be brief and we can summarize or provide greater detail for the record. On methanol, the policy office, which I head, has done a great deal of work looking at the cost of production, the cost of transporting it, the uh, toxicity of it, the effects of spills, the infrastructure associated with getting it from ports, where will it come from, what will it cost. Many of these studies have been released and are available, and we continue to provide that expertise to the White House and the EPA. It is a mag methanol is a magnificently toxic substance, is it not? Y yes, it is. One, uh, one when of the when most ingested, I there certainly. Is. 
It and is. At low concentrations in the air, I believe it has enormous levels of peril to persons in the vicinity, does it not? It does. It tends to, to dissipate, of course, in the air because it's a, it's a gas, but, uh, or, it, or it, can, it evaporates quickly. But uh, until that happens, it certainly is very toxic. Uh, in addition, the Department uh, in the Office of Conservation and Renewable Energy has a substantial electric vehicle program. We spend uh, several millions of dollars a year. I think it's around 11, but I would have to provide details of that for the record. We are principally looking at battery technology. That seems to be the chief holdup right now to greater, uh, really, commercialization of that technology, although there are those, as you're no doubt aware, that uh, are moving to do that. We're still dependent mostly, I think, on lead sulfate batteries for, for vehicular use, are we not? I believe that's correct. We're hoping for uh, lithium, uh, sodium, cadmium, and that sort of thing, but they are not yet available, are they, in, in, in terms of usable technology? Not, I think, in any one that even by any stretch would be commercial or commercially <coughs> available. Uh, we are also looking at uh, and have particular interest in biofuels. And that is ethanol, but that is not ethanol in the sense that most of us have thought of it, which is from feed grains. It is the department's view and that of, of Sari and others who have looked at this for many years, that as long as we produce alcohol from feed grain, it will be very difficult for that to be cost effective and economical. If, on the other hand, we can produce it from, from weeds, what are in essence weeds and stalks and things that have no other commercial value, then we may be able to be cost effective and uh, would also provide benefits in terms of CO2 reduction. It would be a closed cycle in that we would, as the plants grow, they would absorb CO2 from the air, and that way it uh, overall has a salutary benefit on the environment. Uh, again, the Con Office of Conservation and Renewable Energy is expending significant resources in that direction. I believe that there are new technologies such as membrane permeability that will help uh, bring the cost of that down. Uh, we are looking at compressed natural gas. It is an area that has been handled for the department largely by the Gas Research Institute. Uh, I will be candid and tell you that I do not think the department has done as much in that area as we could have. It has been regarded as somewhat a mature technology, not something that needed much additional boost. I think that maybe is, uh, I, I believe that is changing and will be reflected in next year's budget. Uh, finally, we are looking, as you suggested, at continuing to look at, at synthetic fuels, methanol from coal, uh, liquid fuels derived from coal and oil shale. The uh, National Academy of Sciences is about to publish, I believe any day now, a comprehensive assessment of fossil-based alternative fuels, fossil-based liquid fuels. Uh, what can they achieve? What's the most likely sources? Cost effectiveness? What are research priorities in those areas? And we hope to use that in better targeting our resources to get, uh, to get the best. But we certainly think at this point that uh, we need to keep all these things on the plate. None of these things strikes us as such a silver bullet that it's time to just focus on that, and we believe it's uh, probably each will have a role to play, some in, in fleets, some in remote locations, and uh, we need to, to try and move forward with them all. Thank you, Ms. Dunce. The Chair is going to request again that Mr. Wu work with you to try and develop further information on this for purposes of the record. Now, Admiral, you, you have made some comments with which I thoroughly agree, and that is you've stated that technology transfer is the guts of the economic strength of this nation's energy strategy. Uh, this is, is, I think we both agree, very important. Uh, I, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that the subcommittee here is reviewing technology transfer at DOE and that we have some concerns about matters that we're finding in connection with this. Now, it, it, I believe it, you would agree with me that this transfer, if it is to be conducted, must be done so in a fair and equitable manner. Is that right? Absolutely, yes, sir. Now, Mr. Secretary, what type of direction are you providing to the people at the agency to ensure that the technology transfer is conducted in a fair and, uh, and equitable fashion? Well, uh, we have a task force that's doing nothing but looking at the technology transfer issue. We have a bilateral uh, agreement with the Department of Commerce just on this one issue. We've held hearings here on Capitol Hill. Uh, members of Congress have become, uh, come before us on the technology transfer issue. There's a bill in the Senate last year that was passed on uh, technology transfer. Uh, it's called the National Competitive Technology Transfer Act of 89. Uh, we're in the process of, uh, of uh, complying with that. We've uh, met our milestones to date and we'll continue to meet our milestones in that area. That's just the start. I believe we're going to find that there are many obstacles to technology transfer that we, we're going to need congressional help on. Uh, ethics is one. 
uh, conflict of interest uh, issues regarding the technology transfer of human beings when the technology is actually transferred to the private sector. We're going to have to deal with that issue. Uh, we have some, uh, we have some, uh, uh, a number of other laws that are going to have to be looked at uh, that uh, we're going to need help on to make sure that we have a process that is both equitable and, uh, and streamlined. Uh, today we run about two years behind our foreign competitors in taking our technology and putting it into our sector. So we're, mu we're losing about 100 to 1 leverage on our research dollars. If we're putting in a billion dollars, for example, on, uh, clean, uh, on, uh, on global climate change, uh, then hopefully we'll get 100 billion back if we can get the technologies that emerge from that back into our own sector. Uh, and I think these are the kinds of things that we're looking at now. This is why I say this waste management is so important because we're putting uh, really now about 2.8 billion a year, most of which is site characterization and research work. And we need to get the leverage back on that so that we clean up ourselves with our own equipments that are generated by our own industry and get the jobs and the business in there uh, before we buy offshore. And it's sad to go into our national laboratories and see our technology that we grew out of basic research sold back to us in $2 million optical machines and the like, which are not made in the USA. So we've got, uh, this is the real, I think, the real, one of the real uh, jewels that's come out of this, uh, these hearings to date is that technology transfer, as strange as it may seem, becomes a strong underpinning for achieving the goals that I hope we're going to be able to set out in the National Energy Strategy. That's where the DOE, the national uh, economics, are going to be strengthened if we do our job right. And we, we will identify for you. We're not ready to do it yet. But we're coming close to finding exactly the right path. And that will be part of our National Energy Strategy uh, hearing. And in fact, we have a, a paper on that that we're now working in the interagency group to focus on this. And I'm on the Council of Competitors with the Vice President taking just a few case studies, such as biotechnology alone. And we're very much involved in biotechnology. Uh, and so. We, ha we have a lot of work to do in that area, but I would hope that you in particular would, would help uh, uh, spearhead the effort up here to uh, keep moving on this technology transfer in this context to get our own industry uh, sharing in the, in the benefits of uh, good, solid, basic research. You and I have no, no quarrel on this, Mr. Secretary, and I assure you of my full support for that and also for your view of the matter. I would, as your friend, advise you that this, that this subcommittee is looking at uh, cases involving technology transfers at Livermore Laboratory, and uh, we're not sure that proper guidance has been provided by DOE to the laboratory, uh, which may have resulted in some actions with the laboratory, which are not as uh, much in conformity with, with I'm aware the principles of that, you and I are, and I share are espousing your here today. Obviously, this is going to be uh, part of the, uh, of the uh, strength of anything we come out in the way of proposals on transfer of technology that anything we're doing inappropriately certainly is going to be, uh, have to be uh, proscribed. Uh, but we also find that there are a number of very legitimate situations that have come up where people are afraid to transfer the technology because of the very thing that you're raising here. So we, we have both sides of we the have a nice line that we have to walk here. on. Yes, sir. Mr. Secretary, um, these are questions now relate to International Energy Agency and others. Um, what is the uh, status of health of the International Energy Agency? Is it good, or has it been falling into disuse, as I suspect, over recent years and months? I think it's uh, uh, coming alive probably because of the pressures of uh, global climate change. Uh, I mean, these are the kinds of things that drive you <coughs> into new ways of doing business. Uh, we've, uh, we've discussed uh, uh, many things last year that I thought were very, uh, very progressive, very proper, very balanced. Uh, we had a good uh, communique, uh, I think, that came out of the International Energy Agency, and I found it illuminating and helpful. And I think we had a chance to make a U.S. input into that that brought some balance in what I would have considered extremes on the issue of nuclear, for example. And uh, that's before we ever got to the International Atomic Energy Agency meeting, which was, I thought, very positive in terms of our concerns about uh, ramifications of another accident anywhere in the world and what we would do to uh, help preclude that. And I'm very much involved, as I think we've four of you uh, in official correspondence, uh, with the Soviet Union in a bilateral effort uh, to help them uh, mitigate any potential accidents from their VVE or ER-230 440 megawatt reactors and their RBMK, the two worst actors 
uh, from our design review, which the Soviet agreed to, and we paid $5, uh, $5 million to effect. And it gave us the license then to go back to the Soviet and say, okay, now we've done this analysis. Uh, you've got these problems, positive void coefficient and uh, no uh, uh, core cooling under emergency conditions. We believe that there are new disciplines that you can impose from our lessons learned out of Three Mile Island, said so if you'll do these things, we can set up procedures for you and discipline in your plant operation and bring your operators into the, into, the, into the realm of science and technology that they never have been brought in on and will do a lot to allay fears in your own country as well as Eastern Europe and the rest of Europe that you're going to have another accident, particularly on the bad actors. Their later designs are, are different, a different story, but still they need these kinds of uh, regulatory disciplines, if you will, that, uh, that we've had in the Navy since its outset under Rickover and we've had since Three Mile Island in the private sector and we're now trying to put into effect in DOE in the defense sector. Uh, France is good at it, Japan's good at it, their operation, and we need to bring the Soviet into that game and that's what we're doing today on a very aggressive basis. In fact, we'll be meeting our second time in May to do just this uh, and this is just, just on operations. How do we learn to operate the existing plants that we know are not as well designed as they should be to mitigate potential accidents, and that can be done. Power reductions under certain conditions, procedures, or virtually casually uh, procedures can be written, uh, to the proper programming in a computer for simulation of certain accidents the operators can train on, and even recognition that the Soviet operators are critical, and they can't separate them from the Ministry of Science and Technology, which they did for years, and now they brought them together, so they're very responsive and very receptive to our initiative in this regard. That's coming out of the Inter uh, International uh, Atomic Energy Agency meeting. So I think these are positive, and I think you'll see more in waste management. It's an international issue, and, and it, it goes transboundary. And uh, so I believe that global change, the, the accident at Chernobyl, uh, the oil problem in the, in the Persian Gulf has tended to bring this back to life, not because the bureaucracy would have done it uh, without these, because I don't think they would have, but the fact that they are being very responsive now I think is a good sign. Of course, I'm, I, I, and I commend you for that. I'm, I was going to get to the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, in a moment. Your comments on that are comforting. Uh, I trust that, that you're making equal efforts with regard to some of the DOE reactor systems and reactor personnel. There were some very major problems you'll recall there, Mr. Secretary. I live and breathe that, Mr. Chairman. I was brought in to clean up that mess, and that's what I'm going to do. I, I, I know you've been making, it, and I don't want you to think you're here to get a wig pulling, Ms. Secretary. Uh, other secretaries might have come up here and gotten quite a wigging, but uh, uh, I haven't recognized you're trying, but I just want, to, just want to make sure the record reflects the fact that you're doing so and you're committing to continue to do so. I will invite you, Mr. Chairman, when we get to full power in the K reactor uh, in probably January of, of 91 to come down with us and have the flag raising ceremony. Mr. Secretary, let's get back to the International Atomic Energy Agency. <coughs> I'm going to ask Mr. Wu and uh, again Ms. Dunst to work together to get some proper inserts into the record with regard to our participation on that. Is our financial and, and other participation in that agency uh, continuing at the pace that it is supposed to under our international agreements? Uh, yes, sir, it is. As you know, we only have a biennial meeting of the uh, of, um, of the, of the ministers at uh, my level, uh, we'll, there'll be no uh, IEA meeting this summer in Paris. We will go in 1991, as we as we went last year. But we are in constant communication with their uh, delegation, their people through our international energy, uh, uh, through our international agent, uh, energy assistant secretary, who spent a great deal of time working with the nations, both on a multilateral and a bilateral basis, on a variety of areas, and we're establishing a lot of new relationships with with other nations uh, in the various areas that will feed the IEA and make it better from the United States point of view. Bilaterals with Italy have just been expanded and some work we're doing with them on geothermal and a range of other areas, waste management, uh, bilateral with Japan being expanded with some new nations that are coming in. So I think you'll, I think you'll find that our, our efforts there uh, in the bilateral business feed the IEA and will we'll at attempt to uh, make it stronger and uh, a much bigger player as we move into some of the global aspects of energy that, I, again, I say have, have been brought about by the global climate change threat. Mr. Secretary, um, with regard to the SEED Act, the Support for East European Democracy Act of 1989, 
as a matter in which I was rather specially interested. The Department of Energy has responsibility to assist Poland in assessing and developing its own clean coal technology capability. Can you tell us what progress has been made in this area? Uh, I can only tell you, Mr. Chairman, I'll provide more details for the record if you'd like, but uh, uh, it is underway, it's on schedule, it's very well received in our meetings with the uh, uh, Polish delegation, and uh, in addition to the um, uh, $10 million going into the clean coal technology demonstration there near Krakow, we're also uh, building uh, an academy, uh, an energy academy, um, we're helping the Hungarians build their first uh, capability to monitor their own situation internally and we're, we're helping to do that. We've got about now 30 million dollars uh, appropriated by Congress mm -hmm. under that uh, particular legislation last, last year and, and we, we find it not only helpful but it was uh, very important during recent discussions with uh, appropriate delegations during the international uh, conference on uh, science and economics relating to global change that we just held. So we had a lot of good, solid bilateral discussions with our counterparts there to, uh, to uh, a follow up. I hope to be able to visit uh, Poland uh, next year to see just how our pro progress is really going there on that particular plant. But as far as I know, it's going well. Is there any attempt being made to divert funds uh, targeted for Poland into other areas? Not that I know of, Mr. Chairman, but the very fact you asked me the question worries me. Uh, so if you have that. any, if Mr. Wu in his discussion with us would give us any clues there, we will, we will fight hard against that. We think this is very important uh, in a sadly neglected uh, environmental situation over there. It's really tragic. Uh, and this is we just a, a, obviously just a toe in the door of dealing with that. But uh, coal's going to be with them for a long time to come and we've got to help them out. Now, the, one of the major missions of the Ato International Atomic Energy Agency has uh, has uh, been to monitor movement of nuclear materials, particularly bomb grade and weapon grade uh, uh, uranium and plutonium. Uh, it has been a matter of some international concern that there may have been leakage. Can you give us a statement as to the status of how the signatory agency uh, countries to that to that agency are functioning and whether there's any reason for us to be apprehensive about leakage uh, of special nuclear materials into uh, perhaps undesirable hands well certainly uh, mr. chairman I, I I don't think from a policy standpoint point there's any question that the, the nations in the International Atomic Energy Agency are very serious about their work in nonproliferation uh, it comes up at every meeting uh, it, it's, uh, it's very critically looked at by us when we re review any of the exporting of, uh, of uh, material and that sort of thing. Uh, so I believe it's, it's, uh, it's well structured. Now when you say is our counterintelligence ability uh, sufficient to uh, ward off those who would uh, somehow try to subvert that system, uh, I think it's been pretty good as far as the U.S. is concerned in our cooperation with the Brits. Uh, recently, and uh, and I think it is very good in many of the other nations. Uh, but somehow, uh, we have seen cases where, uh, despite all that, there are uh, people who are willing uh, to sell their souls. Uh, but I do think it's it's uh, reasonably under control, and uh, certainly it is a serious issue with us, uh, with all of us as members. And uh, and I have, in fact, I intend to strengthen my own organization and bring uh, the nonproliferation aspects probably under the Assistant Secretary for International Energy and out of defense programs where it currently exists for this very reason because I don't believe it belongs in that area. It belongs outside that uh, area and, it, and it more directly involved with me in setting policies along those lines. So I think it's aggressive. I think it's, it's basically good. Does it mean you can't subvert it under extreme conditions of, uh, of, uh, that we have uh, just seen uh, uh, manifested recently? I think no, but, but I believe we're pretty good at catching those people. Now, Mr. Secretary, we've heard some reports, you've alluded to this in a brief way earlier, that electrical utilities, particularly in the East Coast, may lack power supply necessary to cool or heat American homes and to power American industry. There have been, as I'm sure we're both aware, power outages in Florida and Texas last December, to which you alluded briefly. Um, are these reports uh, credible with regard to uh, potential power shortages, brownouts, blackouts? 
and so forth, and uh, if so, what is being done to address this, either within the department or within the industry itself? Let me, uh, let me just, I, I can't talk about specific regions other than the Northeast, and obviously we have situations that come up uh, uh, regionally in other parts of the country that I think are more uh, near-term perturbations than the long-term uh, trends and problems that we see in the Northeast of the United States, which are very clear. Uh, I do believe that we have uh, some, uh, some uh, transition, transmission line efficiencies that can be enhanced uh, and, uh, and uh, gas and oil pipeline efficiencies that can be enhanced to minimize uh, that kind of a regional brownout uh, where we have primarily uh, determined after the fact that it was more, more or less misplaced stocks, if you will, of energy sources rather than the fact that we didn't have the total resource available. And so I think those are the kinds of things we're looking into in the energy strategy. Uh, and uh, I hopefully our margins of, of safety are going to be raised and our more attentive review of those ancillary uh, uh, energy issues that we're not directly responsible for, such as heating oil or alternate sources of gas, such as propane, uh, will enhance our awareness of those things and bring people in early. And also continuing the, the energy strategy, this is not a one-time shot. This is hopefully we'll have a national energy modeling system as a database and we'll be able to continually monitor how we're doing against our objectives and changing course as needed over time. Where uh, when we find out a specific regional problem like that, we can say, all right, we have another regulatory barrier or transmission inefficiency for the power that we must resolve. And we can put pressure, I hope, on the system uh, to bring about change, even though we may not have the responsibility at the federal level. We can influence state thinking in that regard. And that was, that's how I, in general, would say we're approaching it. If, if Ms. Dunst, if you have any other comments about regional the regional problems other than what I've addressed? I would just say this will be, I think, one of the most difficult areas we have to address in the national energy strategy because there are so many issues and they are so complicated substantively and politically. But we are looking first at regulatory reform. Uh, we need to find a way to give utilities confidence that they can invest in new generation without having uh, second guessing and disallowances for, for no adequate reason. Uh, one. NES person called this a rolling prudence review so that there would be sort of continual review and there would not be such a large amount of capital outstanding without any sense of whether that would be regarded as prudently expended by the rate makers. Secondly, we are looking at statutory reform. The PUCA reform issue has no doubt uh, become known to you. It is one that we are carefully looking at to see what the consequences of the various amendments and the various legislative proposals that have been made would be both near term and longer term in terms of its effect on the entire electricity industry. Uh, finally, we are looking, of course, with great interest at some of the experiments that are being conducted by the states in terms of competitive bidding uh, and are particularly interested in some of the competitive procurement of demand side services that we're seeing. It seems to us that demand side services ought to be at least on the same playing field as, as generating side if we can meet electricity demand by retrofitting an industrial plant so as to reduce its electricity needs, that might make sense. Uh, more sense than building yet another power plant. But, uh, and some states are moving forward in this way aggressively. Some states are moving a little more slowly, perhaps because they have different resource needs. That is an area where we have to work very closely with the states, be very sensitive to differences in regional uh, resources, and uh, it is one where we will need to work very closely with the committee, with the state regulators, with industry, and with FERC if we are to come up with helpful suggestions. Thank you. Chair is going to again request Mr. Wu and Ms. Dunst work together to uh, assemble some, some additional information of interest to the committee on this particular point. Now, Ms. Secretary, uh, you and Ms. Dunst have just referred to one of what I think is one of the major debates in the electrical utility industry, and that is how and uh, the, the electrical utility market should be structured or should structure itself and how government should respond to this, uh, and also whether the electrical utility and uh, that market should be more competitive or whether the general overall historic regulatory compact that's been utilized in the country over time should continue to be used. Do you have some thoughts you'd like to enunciate at this time, or would you prefer to give I, us I some comments? I think I prefer to wait on that. It's probably the most, uh, uh, most potentially charged area uh, that we've heard as we move around the country. Uh, we have a section here 
uh, some 16 pages, a very large section in here on electricity. And uh, while we don't have all the answers in there, I think it would be premature for me now uh, when this is one of the critical areas that's kind of at the focal point of so much of our uh, environmental concern because of the uh, uh, energy uh, contribution uh, to environmental issues. Uh, and so we're, we're going to have to, and also it's, it's very contentious in, in terms of any regulatory reform. We hear as much pros on one side of a set of issues uh, on PUCA reform, for example, as we hear on the other from the industry. So we, we have to be, I think, uh, very cautious at this point. It is, it, we don't have the solutions yet. We've heard the tremendous differences, though, in the regions uh, of the country. And uh, one particular utility feels very, uh, very calm about uh, certain initiatives on the Senate side uh, that would, uh, would, uh, would reform the current uh, uh, act. And others on the other side are just vehemently opposed. Uh, so those are the kind of things that when you call about, the, say, that we have some tough issues to face, I would say this is about the toughest uh, in here. And uh, this is going to require an awful lot of work by us with considerable additional hearings, is my guess, on this one issue alone of how we're going to do when we lay out a, perhaps a menu of possibilities and then listen to that debate and see if we can find a, a set of grounds that will give regional sensitivity, but yet set some general principles that seem to make a lot of sense and then move us in that direction. Any further questions? Um, yeah. Mr. McMillan, why do you have this consent? Oh, Mr. McMillan and other members of the committee have asked unanimous consent to insert their statements in the record without objection. That will be ordered. Mr. Secretary, we've kept you and Ms. Dunce a long time. Privilege to have you before the committee. Your assistance has been very much appreciated. We commend you and thank you for your participation. Thank today. you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both. The committee will stand adjourned until we call the chair. bring you another hearing by a House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee at about 5.50 a.m. Eastern Time. The Subcommittee on Health and the Environment looks at breast and cervical cancer. After this short break, remarks by the Director of the Office of Drug Control Policy, William Bennett. from the nation's capital you're watching C-SPAN 2 and we'll take a break now to bring you some information about